Mythos Busters, investigating the mystery, monsters, and madness of Arkham Horror, the card game. Hello and welcome to episode 43 of Mythos Busters, where today it's Friday, Friday, gotta get podcasting on Friday. I'm gonna punch you so (laughs) hard. Party and party and yeah! I'm Sean. Uh, I couldn't resist. Uh, and joining me tonight, of course, as you heard, is Scott. Hi, Scott. Hello. I feel like you and I haven't spoken in forever. We we haven't it, podcasted in forever, first of all, and you've also been super busy with work, so I'm happy to have you here tonight. Yeah, it's been a while. I am super excited to be on. <laughs> I love podcasting. <laughs> it, it turns out. Uh, and joining us tonight as well is Ian. Hi, Ian. Oh, hello there. Are, are you going to show everyone your valor tonight? <laughs> <laughs> yep, they can peer deep into my palantir if they so choose. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> that was so innocuous on its surface, but if you go, like, one layer deep, it's a hellscape. Um, I just need a gif of Grima giving an eye waggle at this point. <laughs> it would be my dream gif. <laughs> oh, you mean, like, like, like my favorite one here? Like, 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 like this guy? It's that that gift summarizes my life. <laughs> yeah. It's the, the, the eyebrow waggle little finger gif. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. Missing tonight is Nick. Uh, unfortunately, he has been lost in time and space. Um, or he may have no internet. I, I figure it's about the same thing. Yeah. That's so he won't be same. joining us for this episode. <laughs> we'll see him on the next one, hopefully. So tonight, we're actually getting back on track, guys. We're going to cover our news as we do. And then our discussion topic is going to be our deep dive into uh, Threads of Fate and the Boundary Beyond. And then, of course, we'll close it out with a bit of tentacle time. You guys ready to get started here? Mm-hmm. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, yes. so before we get started on the, the, the meat of the show, I want to check in with you guys because I know a little bit about at least what Ian's been playing because we actually got to see each other in person for about half a week. Um, But Scott, what have you been up to aside from working crazy hours? Have you had any time to play? Uh, I've had a little bit, uh, mostly online with uh, BD Florian Spoon, who is like my, they're my like go-to online game group because we're all available like weekdays in the morning when I'm off shift. Hmm. Uh, So yeah, we play a lot of games. Um, We're currently making our way through uh, TFA and... Spoon was actually playing skids, and uh, you'd think, you know, high agility, that'd be great, and, you know, I know there's been a lot of talk about lower willpower and how that's not so great. Um, We are at, what's just after Boundary Beyond? Uh, Heart of the Elders? Heart of the Elders. No, sorry, we just finished Boundary Beyond. Mm -hmm. Okay. No. We, We got halfway through Heart of Elders. If you oh, know what I mean. Yes. Okay. You completed Act One of Heart of the Elders. Yes. Uh, Skids has five mental traumas. <laughs> uh, at this point, uh, Spoon decided to retire him voluntarily. Uh, <laughs> but I just thought that was funny because there's so much talk about Skids and people disagreeing with me about, I think, of his power level. But I, I was just laughing that. We were going into scenarios the way that works in that scenario, if you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't want to spoil anything, but... Um, and Skids had one willpower... Or, sorry, one sanity left. And he was just like, oh, I'm dead. Like, it was... Skids, a Skids is in a weird place. Uh, like, Rogue, they have gotten some really good cards of late, but a lot of them really ask you to lean into agility. Mm-hmm. And then and then Skid's Guardian access really wants you to be like, hey, let's fight with combat. And like he's he's definitely better than than he was in that era when everyone just chat on Skids all the time. <laughs> yes. But guys, two willpower is still a thing. Unless you're Silas, in in which case it's it's mostly not a thing. Mm-hmm. But if you if you're Finn, which is who I'm currently pairing with Silas right now, 
<laughs> it's uh, it can be a rough go. Turns out willpower still matters ultimately. Mm-hmm. The other thing I've been I've really been enjoying playing Ursula. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think she might be my favorite Gator out of the out of the TFA box. Okay. Uh, the big thing that uh, Br- uh, BD Flory pointed out to me was when you have two field works. Uh, when you move to a location and you trigger, you can trigger her special ability to do an investigate. Uh-huh. You can actually layer the triggers so you do field work, her special investigate, field work, and then you can add one field work to her special one, and then the next test you take gets the other field work. Ah, oh, I like it because you know they, they all three trigger off the same instance of moving. Right, and normally with any other investigator, you move and you have to either trigger both of them or only one of them. But now, staggering that's, them. That's only if the the investigate action doesn't swipe the last clue, right? Uh, yes. No. Uh, yes, correct. Can't swipe the last clue. Okay. Still yeah. an awesome trick. Because field yeah, work, is, field work and Pathfinder are like tailor made for Ursula. Oh my goodness! Yeah, once you get Pathfinder, field work, and I don't know, magnifying glass up. Like, it just... Life yeah, feels pretty good ridiculous. at that point. Mm-hmm. Or Dr. Milan. <laughs> yes. All right. Uh, Ian, what have you been up to since our Gen Con <clears throat> escapades? Uh, as far as Arkham is concerned, I haven't had <clears throat> as much time to play it as I usually do. Or, I guess I've been splitting it between a, a, a few different games, which has meant less time. But I've mostly just been catching up uh, my campaigns through Heart of the Elders. So the last one I played is, speaking of Finn, Finn Solo. And uh, I can't speak to multiplayer, but at least in Solo and Two-Handed, I'm still on the train that willpower is, low willpower is not a, is not a, a deal breaker. Because... Other than Bound uh, Threads of Fate, which was uh, Finn's one poor showing, the rest he's been blazing through Forgotten Age without too much trouble. Now, it's not necessarily a deal breaker, but it is a thing, right? He'll admit it's a thing. It's a thing, but I feel like... It's a thing! He said it! Every investigator has a thing, though, right? Like, they all have weaknesses, Other, except for... Yeah, they all do, in, in some capacity, so... I, I feel like my only gripe is when people make it that willpower is more of a thing than the weaknesses that other investigators have. I feel like a lot, a lot, a lot tests will, though. All right, no, we've had this discussion. We, we, <laughs> must, we must not go down this rabbit hole right now. So, aside from Finn, do you have any other, what other campaigns have you caught up? Um, I still have to play Calvin and Lola through Heart of the Elder, so that one is still on deck, which is the really fun campaign to play. I played Solo Leo through, who continues to be a beast, and, uh, what's the, oh, my Solo Ursula is the blind, uh, my blind campaign, so that's the one that's going the worst of them all. <laughs> Even though she's a, she's a competent, uh, solo investigator, uh, the blind campaigns are just rough, uh, Especially, mm-hmm. I've heard a lot of people say that uh, agility is like more important in Forgotten Age than past campaigns, and I actually disagree. Being a solo player that plays a lot of evade heavy investigator solo, so just take it in that context. So I'm not sure about multiplayer games because I don't play them that much. But at least solo can confirm. <clears throat> at least solo play, I played played a ton of evade heavy investigators in Carcosa and Dunwich, and now Forgotten Age, like. Forgotten Age is at potentially the least friendly to the evade strategy, in my opinion. Uh, just what? Th- just because there are some... Uh, there's a lot of hunters. Like, there's so many hunters. I would like to see the mm-hmm. statistics, but I feel like this mo- might have the most hunters. And then there's also Gotta been some with scenarios it. with just small maps, or like Doom of Esli, where it forces you into a linear thing. Now, thankfully, mm-hmm. if you have an investigator that has like Elusive or something, you can get around it. But if you don't, then you're just having to evade your way back through like those five enemies that you didn't kill. So <laughs> I don't know. <clears throat> but there's there's so many things that punish you for actually killing or attacking enemies. Sure. Yes, it does both. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's like it punishes it it punishes you for dealing with enemies. Period. Mm-hmm. Like yeah, whether either you kill way. them or evade them. Yeah. yeah. Like like I'll say it's it's not that I'm saying that it's not 
a possible strategy because again finn solo has been doing well it's just that it's not like i don't necessarily see the argument that it's better because i feel like the evade strategy in carcosa was was super effective with the the only uh the only exceptions of curtain call because of the very small map and dim carcosa because of the very small map um but the rest of it was very friendly to just avoiding enemies because there weren't a ton of hunters around and you could run away from those that were but forgotten age and there weren't it's, like it's trickier. 16 billion cultists mm-hmm. oh wait we're, we're talking about boundary later <laughs> <laughs> i i think one thing though ian too is i think it it punishes evasion strategies and also killing enemy strategies yeah, yeah. but it more so punishes low agility period on other tests so ignore sure. enemy management it if you have a low agility you're gonna be failing a lot of encounter cards or location tests stuff like that yeah it definitely does test um agility more on treacheries uh mm-hmm. for someone like uh solo leo that would potentially be a downside for him but uh, he's actually one of the most effective solo investigators that I'm running just because for him, he have charisma going. He can just going. keep spitting out meat. Yeah, he's spitting yeah. out meat, so a lot of the agility tests uh, deal damage or something like that, so Leo's mm-hmm. just like, sure, whatever, you know, I'm just gonna tank those tests because it doesn't really matter. Hmm. I saw on the, uh, Sean, you're gonna hate this, I saw on the Facebook oh page today uh, <laughs> or the Arkham group, and someone's like, what's with Leo? He's like the worst investigator ever, and I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, what? <laughs> he's like, Record so scratch. Like it's, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's like, the jukebox and, stops. And like, everyone everyone was stares like, across the bar. <laughs> and he said something like, yeah, I don't find him very good solo. And I was just, oh my goodness. I, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I, I think there was some play errors, or deck building errors, and like people talked it through, and like he's like, oh, okay, I see how this is supposed to work. But, I would, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, let's let's take a quick vote here. Leo's one of the strongest solo investigators in the game at this point, right? I think he's one of the strongest so. investigators across all. Yeah. Unqualified. All. Wow. Yeah. I mean, Forgotten yeah. Age is such a tough campaign, um, which we've talked yes. a little bit about, and the fact that he's done so well in, uh, as in solo form, which I was very unsure about, um, but he's mm. the only time he had trouble is Boundary Beyond, and that's like join the club in solo, you know, yeah. <laughs> like, so, yeah. which we'll get to. <laughs> I, I had one campaign that had a really good run through Boundary Beyond. I'm like, what the hell did I miss? <laughs> you need the stars to line. <laughs> Uh, then I suppose for my part, I I have not been able to play as much Arkham as I've wanted to. Uh, upon getting back from Gen Con, I really, really gave Slumber a good set of runs. I wanted to say it's I gave slumbering. it a beating. No, no, I did not give it a <laughs> But uh, in so doing, and and also in just generally preparing for Gen Con, I kind of fell back in love with building for standalone mode. Mm. Mm-hmm. It it's I do love I love the campaign format of the game yeah. but when you just when you can just build a deck from the cards and, and and just have them there's a magic to that that i think gets a little bit lost or at least it gets spread across the the entire experience of campaign mm-hmm. so you know, I, I still like i'm not i'm not like you guys I, i'm not building my 49 experience decks yet i'm still sticking <laughs> at around 19 <laughs> if i'm getting really saucy i'll push it to 29 but uh yeah, I built I built a Mateo, I built uh Norman. Norman is a standalone investigator, full stop. I mm. will put that down in paper. Playing him yeah. through a campaign, you can definitely do it. He's kinda like he's kinda like Daisy a little bit, except you don't get to do all the really cool high level seeker tricks. But when you get to build him just like from the ground up with nineteen experience, he is a different mm. investigator entirely. Just FYI. I, I agree completely. I think there, there's a few investigators that you're just like, I just need to get through mm-hmm. a couple scenarios for this investigator to become fun. Yeah. Um, he's one of them. Daisy, I totally agree. I find Jim is sure. similar. Lola. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I will say, like, on your standalone thing, I think... St- Standalone scenarios are my least favorite way to play, but my favorite way to deck build. 
that that might be accurate. I I do like the special ones, but I can say that I've almost never, I've never like pulled out Undimensioned and Unseen and played it played it standalone, right. like or where Doom awaits or something. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. uh, I mean, that goes without saying. <laughs> and and on that point, um, I'll, I'll get back to what I've been playing a little bit, but but since we're talking about it, have you guys tried out and then it multiplied yet? Not yet. Have no. we have we talked about that on the podcast yet? I think we mentioned it briefly last time during the news. Okay. Yeah. So so Cliff Notes version, Matt put out a challenge. It's undimensioned and unseen with some very specific setup rules. And uh um I was actually listening to that podcast that shall not be named. Um, <laughs> it's, drawn, it's drawn to the flame though. And they were talking a little bit about it, and they actually went through the the rules line by line. And I'm sitting there because I read the article. I, no, I, I should I should amend that. I skimmed the article when it when it came out. But they were read, reading through the rules line by line, and every time they read a rule, I'm like, oh, that sounds not like not 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 fun at all. <laughs> uh, okay, player card effects. Oh, okay, that's fun. Oh, you can't use any of the movement tricks, which kind of makes that. Oh, okay. All right. Well, I guess I'm never playing that. Yeah. yeah. Oh, they all start and play. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What I mean, I guess that that's a personal preference. Good on anyone mm-hmm. who wants to take on the challenge and see where you get. But to me, like the whole immune to player card effects, and now you can't use these cards. That like takes out what I find fun about the game. I I think, I think make me a deal, okay? You'll try it once at Arkham Knights. I'll try <laughs> we'll anything sp- once, brother. Most <laughs> things twice, <laughs> and we'll specifically build for it because I I think. What you were just saying, where you love building for standalone, mm-hmm. you need to look at the scenario and like pick it apart and be like, I need to build a very, very specific deck and then go at it, knowing what you know. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. it's you, the deck you build for it, you wouldn't take into any other standalone. Mm-hmm. Sure. This is, this is like Lord of the Rings level of teching against a specific quest. Right. Lord of the Rings nightmare pack of a quest. <laughs> mm-hmm. Like, just, yeah. All right, I I will I will definitely do that at Arkham Knight. So let's play then at Multiplied. <laughs> okay. All right. So then rounding back to what what I've been playing, um, I've got a Silas and Finn campaign. As I've mentioned, those two have been remarkably fun together. Um, it's kind of interesting because I have I have Silas built to be a little bit more of a monster killer, and Finn built to be a little bit more of a clover. But just with the way they kind of both work by default. They both just have the capacity to kind of handle your odd enemy that shows up. Mm. So as opposed to a lot of duos where you want to keep them kind of somewhat close together. So if someone gets into a bind, the other one's not that far away to help you out. These two can just go to opposite corners of the map and be relatively fine with that. Mm-hmm. And it's it's been interesting to play that way. <clears throat> yeah, I actually like that style quite a bit. I ran... I think this must have been back in Denwich. Like one of my favorite two-handed campaigns was Roland and Jim, who mm. <clears throat> similar they yes. can both they both can do either fighting or seeking. So yeah, they would just That's be kind a really of good combo. opposite sides of the map, and you know sometimes they join forces when needed. But it's it's just a different way of playing than the usual like one fighter, one seeker. Yeah. And and kind of along the same lines, I have my other main campaign that I've gotten, you know, mostly caught up is Ursula and Mateo, mm-hmm. who, which which is kind of an odd pairing because you go like, oh well, what do you do about enemies? But obviously Ursula's got her high agility. She's got I've got a plan. Like I've got key of ease and uh, disc of Itzamna in there. Mateo's rocking his manipulation tricks plus of course miss aurelia like that that is a really fun campaign and that is actually the campaign that i have the best run of boundary beyond with hmm. oddly enough Interesting. It wouldn't it like i wouldn't have guessed that <laughs> but yeah so anyway we'll talk about that as we get through but uh i'm, I'm really looking forward to cracking harder into getting my other campaigns caught up because now i'm kind of i played slumber enough I got caught up, and now, now we just have to get caught up to the blisteringly fast release cycle that happens <laughs> if you're playing Arkham and any other fantasy Exa- play exactly. game. Except Conquest. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'll pour one out. It's okay, I'm over it. Are you, though? Uh, yeah. 
Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Flash forward to a couple hours where Scott's just huddled in the corner of his room next to the Conquest Shrine. <laughs> okay, total sidebar. Uh, <laughs> weeping over his first player token. <laughs> Games Workshop just released a Warhammer 40k magazine, a monthly magazine or whatever, and they called it Conquest. <laughs> They're trolling. <laughs> like, Yikers. what a bunch of dicks. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah. All right. I, I, was about, I was about to defend it for a second, but then I decided better against it. <laughs> so, that being said, guys, surprisingly, despite how long it's been since we've had a legit episode, there has been remarkably little news. Yeah. Uh, but, Ian, I will leave it to you while I go fill up my beer. Okay, sure. So, as Sean mentioned, yeah, we, it's kind of been a little bit of a drought of uh, Arkham News, I think, because Gen Con hit, and then also because mm-hmm. FFG has been pumping out announcements about a tons of other stuff, everything else, pretty much. But uh, everyone's waiting for the next cycle to be announced. Hopefully that'll be pretty soon, in the next couple of weeks, maybe, if past trends are any indication which they're not always. But uh, anyway, the only real uh, thing we got, other than just them saying Hearts of the Elders was available, uh, which it is. That scenario came out well since we last recorded. But uh, they announced, uh, and this had previously been announced, but they just gave some more details about the Guardians of the Abyss scenario pack, which is uh, kind of a standalone pack that's going to contain both the scenario from Gen Con, the Eternal Slumber, and the scenario from Arkham Knights uh, coming up in October, which is called the Knights Usurper. And so those two are going to be bundled together into one scenario pack called Guardians of the Abyss, <clears throat> without the promos, of course. But yeah, the, no release of date course. on that. Yeah, <laughs> no release date on <laughs> that, but... uh at some point, probably after Arkham Knights, I'm guessing it'll come out. Yeah. So <clears throat> let's touch in a non-story spoilery way, Ian, about our experience with Slumber thus far. Sure. Um, I'll lead because I just want to get my my little nitpick out of the way because in it, as a whole, I <laughs> loved Slumber. The, uh, there's, there's one mechanic that basically, it changes the composition of the chaos bag into intense levels of difficulty. Basically, it changes the skull token into, effectively, a minus four if you're playing four players. And there's three of them in the bag. And that actually scales per player. So, it was, it was just a really odd hill to have to climb at the beginning because, I mean... Ian, you were there. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I feel like every other token pull across the team was a skull. And I know that's not going to happen to everyone, but it, it made it a really weirdly swingy beginning. And after talking, debriefing with everyone else that played, um, I, I, of course, found out that we probably should have just scooped after the first co- couple turns. Yeah, yeah. Because everyone else who had as rough a start as us did scoop and then went on to eventually win, whereas we slogged it out for two hours and then lost in the end. It was still a fair loss and still a fun game, but mm-hmm. it was just a really odd little mechanic at the beginning. Um, am I alone in, in that thought? No, you're not. I definitely felt that too, just because I'm not used to um, seeing that kind of scaling in Arkham Horror usually. Um, that would be something that I often see in like Lord of the Rings, for example, but uh, mm. usually on the uh, Chaos Token kind of modifiers, it's usually just like straight up some modifier or based on something else other than player number, like uh, number of cultists on the board or something like that. So... Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it's it's like a skull token in uh, uh, at a given scenario, it being a minus one, minus one more for each player in the game. It's just, it just feels kind of weird. Yeah, but, yeah. I but beyond that, oh, of course. Then there was there then there was Daniel playing Jim off in the corner, just being like, I don't know what you guys are complaining about. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he was loving those skulls, but I think we were drawing more skulls than he was. That was the problem. (laughs) 
There's so many also, that, that, I just want to point out that was not a legit imitation of Daniel. I feel like I was doing like King Candy there. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, we should talk. So I was playing uh, Skids, speaking of, uh, and Daniel had Jim. And who else did we have on the board? Uh, that first run through, I played my Norman Kluver deck, That's I believe. That's right. And then and we... Then... Oh, I'm blanking. Nick now. was our fourth player, right? Uh, no. <laughs> no, Nick even... was playing off with Casey. Yeah, that's right. Who did? I feel like it was a guardian. I'm really blanking now. It's been too long. Yeah, see, it's like three weeks <laughs> yeah. from Gen Con. It's all just like hazy images at this point. I think it was a guardian because I remember that uh, uh, the guardian. Oh, it was Justin. It was my friend Justin. Oh okay, yeah, okay, we're good. Yeah. He, was... he was playing Rex. Was he playing Rex? No, I thought he was playing a Guardian, wasn't he? Oh no, he was playing. Um, he was playing kind of a well-rounded Yorick. Oh, Yorick, which... that's right. Yeah, because I remember we were having trouble killing a particular enemy, uh, which I won't go into yeah, details about. Yeah, the one that scaled with the strength of the Abyss. Yeah. So first, Sean took a swing, and then uh, Justin with his Yorick took a swing, <laughs> and then finally I killed it with a backstab. I think. Uh, we wasted three <laughs> investigators' turns yeah. and so to many kill resources. a little weeny enemy with three yeah. goddamn hit points because th- of that stupid skull. I think my skids went from like I had a bomb first couple turns, and I went from like twelve resources to like two because of that one stupid enemy. Is ridiculous. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so what you're telling me is you knew there was a bunch of minus fours in the bag, and you didn't pump to plus four. <laughs> Well, <laughs> uh, okay. I, I, I wish I could Good confirm talk. Good or talk. deny, <laughs> but again, it's it's three weeks out. It's it's four weeks out. Hazy pictures. Well, but, you know what? I'll, I will experience it at Arkham Knights, and then I will probably have comments of my own. So. <laughs> yes, but I'll just, okay, I'll just bring. Jim. It is. Uh, I, I'll say the big thing is that we didn't. Um, we didn't really have a straight killer for that scenario was the big yeah. problem. So I think if you have a more well-rounded group uh, with kind of just a, you know, a classic balance of roles, then I think it'll probably do better. But we, we also got hit with bad swing, bad token draws up front too. So, but yeah, overall, yeah, our, I like, our... I, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, I was just gonna agree. Our team comp was bad. And I think I'll just reiterate that the only way you can manage that, slumber level is generally by passing tests and when the slumber level makes it harder to pass tests it's just really easy to stay lodged under that eight ball Mm -hmm. now let's move on to the good stuff because it is (laughs) plentiful yeah so it has (laughs) non-spoilery stuff we can say it has to do with egypt (laughs) Mm. (laughs) and (laughs) and i feel it does justice to that kind of location and theme and it uh unfolds in some surprising ways uh, as far as how the map unfolds, and I feel like that's about as much as I can say without getting too spoilery about it, but yeah, I enjoyed it. I, I find it's hard for me to give good impressions for it, because I feel like it's uh, half a scenario, and I don't mean that in mm. a bad way, but I feel like so much of my ultimate feelings about it is going to depend on uh, the next section, the Knight's Usurper, because yep. mm-hmm. mm-hmm. you kind of get the impression playing it that you're doing the best that you can, uh, but the results of your actions are really going to pay off in the second part. So until then, I'm, I, I can't give my kind of full final stamp on it, but I definitely enjoyed myself playing it. I would generally agree. Uh, the only other non spoil well, non, it's a mechanical spoiler, so sorry. Or, you know, skip forward 30 seconds if you want. But I think this one's really cool in that it has very, it has three very distinct acts. Mm-hmm. And I don't mean that in, in like the literal mechanical <laughs> right. term because we have acts in the game. Like it has, like it, it feels like a movie where it's like, this is happening here now. Then we all move mm. over here. And then this is happening now, and it, it just feels like it's, there's very three distinct segments to it, I will which I thought was pretty cool. I will say the ending to our game was uh, 
pretty funny, um, <laughs> which uh, I guess this is going to spoiler the, the fact that there's a resign option, but I don't think that is going to cause anyone to break into tears. But basically, <laughs> um, uh, myself and Daniel, were we, we got out of Dodge, resigned, and we were doing all kinds of crazy re- maneuvers to accomplishment, com- accomplishment, accomplish it, including your kind of sacrificing himself. But I think I used up like four or five actions with skids just so I could get to the resign and peace out <laughs> <laughs> yeah so i think we had we had two straight up get defeated and then you guys noped out and yep. it was it was it was pretty grim in that last act <laughs> <laughs> not for skids <laughs> he was not kicking up his feet in the train now as is our custom though ian we did mm-hmm. this with lord of the rings last year after the the kind of actual event where we sat down four player you and i sat down two player mm-hmm and I played my Silas killer deck, and you played... Ursula. <clears throat> Ursula. Mm-hmm. And that combo did quite well. We ended up we ended up beating the scenario, which, with a, I want to say, a pretty solid result overall. Yeah, it seemed to about hit, like, the par of what you could expect, uh, based on what kind of Matt's reaction was to our performance. <laughs> so, yeah, I think <laughs> uh, it might, it's one of those things where you're like, oh, I didn't do that well, but it's like, oh, everyone kind of is about that same place. So, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> this this is one I actually really appreciate for its difficulty. Aside from that one little mechanic that I've, uh, of course, gone on at length about, everything else is hard about this scenario, but it feels kind of fun and fair hard, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. I, I think um, it's... You know, going back to what we were talking about earlier with the standalone thing, I think it's it's okay for those to be a little bit harder because you are getting the chance, unless you're including it as part of a campaign, you're getting the chance to tech against it and try out stuff. So mm-hmm. I was like trying out a few rolling solo builds to try to beat it. Have you beaten it solo? Uh, I came close with Roland, but I just hit like a bad token draw at the very end it was i can't it's been a while since i played this actual game but i would think it was something like a uh an auto fail when i when i needed to succeed to win something like that yeah <laughs> that sounds about right <laughs> yeah <laughs> hashtag arkham things <laughs> all right well uh, anyway the, my final word would be i i really enjoyed the scenario especially after getting away from the four player kind of craziness of gen con and and kind of sitting down both you know, with you, and then when I took it home and, and played a little bit two-handed, it's... I'm going to say it's my favorite standalone so far. Mm. I'll, I'll, I'll put wow. that stamp Ooh. on it. And I'm, I'm generally pretty positive on the standalones, so... Wow. I think I'm still Team Carnivale, but that's just because I freaking love that scenario, so... <laughs> it, it's a very good scenario. Um, and, and again, yeah, I think I do have to hold out a little bit for the... What's what's the next one called? The, uh, the Knights, Knights Usurper. Usurper. Mm-hmm. That one. Looking I'm forward to that. Bro- broke a row. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> anyway, so everyone who can get a hold of the, this one when it comes out, I'd recommend it based at least on the first half. Mm-hmm. So, guys... I think we're ready to move into our discussion topic. Anything I've missed before we di- we dive in? I don't think so. Then let's Everyone, go. Let's put on your jocks. Okay, yes, put on your jocks <clears throat> and also put on your spoiler cap because we are going <laughs> in depth into both Threads of Fate and the Boundary Beyond. Nothing is safe or sacred, so if you haven't completed those scenarios and are also sensitive to spoilers, now's the time to pause. Okay, you're still here. All right, so. (laughs) I think that was the best spoiler alert we've ever given. (laughs) I also heard someone, like, get off the channel. It was like, get off now. Ding, (laughs) ding. Usually we just give a throwaway, like, spoilers, and then we just keep talking. (laughs) Yeah. All right, so let's talk player cards first, guys. Any any player cards that you would call special mention to? There there are some really good ones in this Mm, pack. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, I had a really awesome play with marksmanship um, <laughs> that contains a bit of a spoiler for Return to the Night, the Night of the Zealot, so I'm not going to do it. But basically, I did five damage from the location beside the enemy, who <laughs> and the and the enemy at that location was also aloof, so it would have been like a a pain in the butt to actually get there. 
but uh, I one shotted a five health enemy from not my location. So marksmanship seems pretty good. Mm. Good eye sniper. <laughs> I, mm-hmm. I have not played with it yet, but man, that would be so helpful against uh, the stranger in Carcosa if you like vicious blow it, and then or so or mm-hmm. it could just be you know your usual attack or whatnot. Because you only got yeah. three health, so if you're mm-hmm. a marksman, if you, if you're sniping him with a forty five from a location away, that seems pretty good. Mm-hmm. Oh, well, and this can target marksman- elite enemies too. Damn. And it ignores aloof and, and retaliate, retaliate, and it adds a damage. That's that's bummer. like so. If you're yeah. shooting with a forty-five, somehow you're marksman chipping with a forty-five in long distances. It adds another damage onto that. So like this is a default three damage with a gun that actually does something. So. Yeah, and then if you've got anything to tack onto that, it's only money. Man, I uh, any guardian laced build that I've played in since this has come out has not been firearm heavy enough to include it. But yeah, this one seems super good. <laughs> yeah oh the bow <laughs> yeah i guess i guess all the guns already do two damage so you won't even need vicious blow i think it's only the kind of melee weapons that you have some that are no extra damage uh mm-hmm. i want to know exactly how a shotgun works with marksmanship but <laughs> <laughs> slugs slugs bro yeah slugs yeah okay those can shoot long distances accurately, right? <laughs> <laughs> I know guns. Uh, so counter spells a thing, guys. It's mm-hmm. I, I'm gonna go ahead and call it Mystic Lucky. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yep. okay. I, I was expecting I was I was expecting like a fifty percent approval rating there. I'm glad I got the hundred. <laughs> it takes care of that skull token that you hate so much in Eternal Slumber. <laughs> <laughs> It takes care of the skull, and what I also love about it is that you can dark prophecy into this one, where it's mm-hmm. like, mm-hmm. you dig for a token, then immediately cancel it, or if you don't find a token, then great, you pick the best one of the numbers you got, which, you know, chances are there's going to be a good number in there. Mm-hmm. I also feel like Forgotten Age has some, even on standard mode, has some really bad token effects, and so it'd be nice to avoid those. Uh, there's a couple we'll talk about in... Uh, boundary beyond that just keep like taking back whatever progress you make which is really frustrating so it's nice to have that option Uh i'm trying to think arcane research we've talked about when it was previewed i feel like that one as long as you're a mystic who plans to be upgrading spells you take it Mm mm-hmm Mm, yeah i I feel like (laughs) checks out possibly my favorite card from this pack is scene of the crime it's Mm, someone had to rep it for nick ridiculously good for especially trying to make solo guardians work uh now i think so someone like even solo zoe i ran through night of uh, return to night of the zealot and she did decently uh despite some bad luck at the in the third scenario but i mean what else is new with uh devour below but (laughs) um but it just it just it just shows how a single card can make a huge difference uh just upping the clue game because in solo i mean you only really need to in an average scenario like how many clues do you really need to gather so it, anything that can take that take a proportion of that means less resources spent elsewhere yeah and and testless clues in guardian mm. like that's a thing <laughs> Mm-hmm. And it yeah. turns out Guardian has uh, ways to just get enemies, right? I mean, I suppose you can't on the hunt and then play this because that would be your second action, but yeah. Also, has two good icons, turns out. It does. Mm-hmm. And doesn't provoke attacks of opportunity, which is nice. <laughs> also, Roland can... Wait, hang on. Can Is Eidetic Memory 3 XP? Oh, I don't remember. I think it is. I think it is. I was about to say Roland could eidetic memory this, but I don't think Roland can take eidetic memory. Yeah, Casey's mentioning so that's that. that's a non-bow. Three, on the, it's 3 XP. Yeah. Three XP. Oh, on the hunt is fast, and part of the mythos phase, I think it's like a reaction oh. or something to drawing yeah, can, cards. Uh, or that's right, it's instead of what you draw for mythos. Yeah. Okay, so, you could okay, still so that still works. Yep. Especially One if thing to setting that up oh, on uh stick to the plan like you can just you can just grab it when you need it 
Mm. One thing too, just going back to Counterspell, just as an FYI, uh, it cancels the Chaos token, but doesn't cancel that you revealed it. So if you have something mm. like Baseball Bat, and you reveal a skull, you still reveal the skull, and then it gets cancelled. <laughs> That's dumb. As, a, as opposed to like Wendy's power, where it just replaces it, that is, it was never revealed. We, so. we really need some stronger bats in Arkham, man. <laughs> is there some way <laughs> to reinforce saying, like, the bat? Nothing saves a bat nowadays. <laughs> yeah. Like Defiance yeah. doesn't save it. Counterspell doesn't save it. So instead of a bat, maybe use a wrench or a pipe. <laughs> stun, stun, stunning blow. Oh, stunning blow. What a great card. Oh, God, it's so good. It just Especially against... Uh, big bosses or enemies mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. successfully attack and then it's just evaded and you're good for a turn yeah it's huge oh. especially yeah and it's in multiplayer especially i think in multiplayer and especially against there are some of those bosses that just i'm trying to think of an example but there are some that just have ridiculously high evade because you're supposed mm-hmm. to fight them like they're at four plus mm-hmm. um oh in midnight masks you, you could use this against uh ruth is Ruth the nurse that when she gets evaded, she goes to the victory uh, the display? Mor- mortician, isn't she? Oh, yeah. Sorry. She's a mortician. Yes. Anyway, that's real fun. And I, I also will bring this around. This is such an amazingly good card in Silas. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it, it oh, is, yeah. It is so, so good. Because not only is Silas, like, he's playing uh, resourceful more than any other investigator. Just because when you pull his Elder Sign that can commit to basically any test he's doing ex- unless it's like the mythos phase. But even beyond mm-hmm. that, if you pull the elder sign while you're attacking an enemy and this is in your discard pile, you can just be like, Oh yeah. And now it's evaded too. Yeah. How nice. <laughs> yeah. Uh, perseverance, ultimate Calvin oh, tech, but also just really good. <laughs> so good for that. In my Lola Calvin campaign, I, there was a certain scenario where, yeah, Perseverance, I played two of them. Uh, to, I think it was probably Boundary Beyond, actually, <laughs> which would make sense. Uh, allowed him to survive. Because you have uh, Devil's Luck as another option, but it's nice just having the kind of non-XP option that does essentially the same thing. I, I know there's a few mm-hmm. minor differences, but it's because uh, Devil's Luck is any damage or horror, I believe, and this is Perseverance is only uh, that. If it would defeat that you. That would defeat you. Mm-hmm. But in practice, for Calvin, it's essentially the same. Seems like an auto include for Calvin. Mm-hmm. And with two exactly. Will icons, too, so. Yeah. Wait, I thought Will wasn't important, Ian. Well, <laughs> depends gotcha, on who checkmate. you're playing with. <laughs> Okay, I, I gotta throw out to Lucky Cigarette Case just because I love the idea that that succeed by two deck. It's slowly <laughs> getting just a little bit better. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, one day, one day. <laughs> and, and I know we've already talked about it as well. And I have a feeling that this is one that just is is gonna morph with the card pool. But shrewd analysis. How do you guys it. feel about shrewd analysis <laughs> with the? unidentified and untranslated assets we have thus far hate it (laughs) (laughs) but why i because i okay so for solution there's pretty much one that i want and Mm -hmm. there's three of them Mm -hmm. so yep i i just rather not Mm -hmm. (laughs) um the other one i forget what what's the the the, tablets uh, tablets that's the one that from Cargoza. Mm-hmm. Oh, glyphs! Yes, thank you, BD. Glyphs, Glory. glyphs, that's okay, it. Yes. Glyphs. Um, that's one and two, and they're both kind of okay. They're they're closer so, in power level, but I do yeah. think that the stones is something you like build and plan for, versus the mm-hmm. prophecy is one that's just kind of cool. Yeah. So I don't, I don't know. know. I, I I like that it exists. Um, I guess like uh, BD Floor is saying, you can always take it. You just don't have to use it. Yeah. And I guess it'd be good like if you're really low on XP and you're like, whatever, I'm not going to ever get enough XP to upgrade both. You mm-hmm. can just take a risk. Mm-hmm. Um, so I guess, I mean, put one in every deck. Put one in Lola so you can just have only six secret cards in your deck. Like... <laughs> 
you know, she hits her seven. Like, there's ways to use it that way. Does that technically um, count toward her six or yeah. seven or whatever? Mm-hmm. No. All right. Well, there you go. Yeah. Sick tech. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> and you, Nailed yeah, it. any of the permanents, like uh, if you took higher ed in her, there now you only have to put five in your deck. <laughs> but anyways, um, take arcane research just because. Yeah. Take two higher eds because it's that good. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I I see the point of it. I just don't think I'll ever use it. See, I I, I think never say never. I feel like uh, we haven't seen what the. What's the new unidentified one called? The it, is that the tablet? The, uh, the, the, the stones. Okay, the stones. We're Stone. just nailing the card names. names today. I know. <laughs> I suddenly become so bad at like remembering card names. Good Christ. Um, that one obviously is a question mark. But I feel like every time one of those unidentified or untranslated things comes out, we're gonna be like, all right, how comparable are the different options? And if they're pretty comparable. You know, it works. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. I mean, if it ever comes out where it only ever upgrades into one thing, mm. that'd be great. Because <laughs> yeah. it would just be, like, half price. Um, yeah. I feel but like I it's... Get one free, baby. The only time I could really see using it and and taking that risk is if you're playing more in a multiplayer environment not on hard obviously and it's one of those things where like that you're not married married to a particular option it's just like i want something cool with my xp so why not get two things uh versus yeah. you know say you're playing like solo and two-handed and i really need that acidic ichor because otherwise i'm screwed with no combat option like there it would be crazy to use this but yeah Okay, so before this becomes the AB Club, let's move into the scenario <laughs> itself. <laughs> now, I know I, I'm I quite like this scenario, but I feel like you guys are kind of over the moon for this one. So mm-hmm. I'm gonna I'm gonna leave it to you to to sing its praises. By far, my favorite scenario in the game. Period. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. Whoa. <laughs> Coming right yeah. out with it. This is this is I think the only campaign story or campaign scenario that I that I'm like. Yeah, I'd totally play that as a standalone. Okay. And what 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 elevates it to that status? I think the way the the acts work, where you're constantly trying to go for like you have a bunch of things to do and it feels like you're almost in a sandbox where you're mm-hmm. you're in Arkham and it's like, I gotta go do stuff. Oh, I found this clue. I gotta go do this stuff, but your friend's over on the other side of the city and yeah, I don't know. Just the way the story develops in it. Um, anyone else have that experience yeah. where when you're opening that pack you're like all right scenario card agenda <laughs> yep. act act a- act, <laughs> act 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 yeah. act <laughs> ah, what is happening location location look up what the hell <laughs> oh three treacheries okay <laughs> yeah yeah threads of fate is definitely in my top three i'm not sure if i'm ready to commit to saying it's my favorite overall because <laughs> there are some ones i really like but, what are your other two? Oh god, now question. you're gonna have me actually name them. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, name them. Carnival. Uh yeah, that's one. And I don't know, I really like Unspeakable Oath, actually, so that's probably up there for me. Uh, okay. But Threads of Fate might end up yeah. getting that spot. I, I really like it as well, because I one of the things I like about the game and a lot of people do and how they've marketed it is kind of that it has these RPG type elements to it in the way you make decisions and whatnot. But I feel like threads is the closest it's gotten to that feel because I, I think sandbox is a good word for it, that it's the scenario that you most feel like I can go anywhere and do anything. Like obviously there's limitations to it because you're still playing a card game with mechanics, but uh, because yeah. there's these three threads and three kind of paths to explore and which order you do them in and whether you pursue one all the way or mix them up, like there's just so much freedom of how you approach the scenario. And based on what you've done before, changes like who's a good guy and who's a bad guy in terms of these kind of uh, characters that you meet or, you know, you can end up in whole different locations like a police station or museum, depending on how that plays out. It's, that's ah, so good. 
<laughs> the variability of this one is off the charts. Yeah, it really is. Um, I I have personally, as a result of this scenario and others before it, have stopped putting away my midnight masks encounter cards, and I've just I just keep them <laughs> in my in my collection because it seems like whenever we go back to Arkham, it's like yep yeah, yep yeah, crack out midnight masks here we go. <laughs> yeah, that's like, probably I can't, a safe I can't bet. keep it with my other corset stuff anymore. Yeah, so we should just, mention that's one of the cool aspects that I did bring back the Midnight Mask locations and then added Velma's Diner and the Curiosity Shop, I believe, are the two it added. Yeah. And the Town Hall. And the Town Hall, yeah. Um, yeah. So it, it, it's cool both having the kind of old map and then some new locations feel like you're exploring the city. Mm-hmm. I felt like it was... You know, kind of in what you said with the, the the RPG element, I felt like this was an RPG within an RPG. <laughs> you know, like you have the whole campaign that's an RPG, but this was like a little mini campaign within a campaign. Mm. I guess is a better way of saying it. And I think that's what really drew me to it, um, and makes me think I would play this a lot uh, standalone. Yeah, it's, I, I really hope we see more of this type of scenario in the future. Like, maybe not the exact same thing, but, I mean, actually, I would probably like even the exact same thing, just with different components, you know, but <laughs> the same type of approach. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't mind seeing that again, because it is such you a You know what I would feel. love seeing? I would, I, and, and Matt, if you're listening to this episode, think about this. Maybe run a past marketing or whoever would have to give the blessing. But I would love to see just like a... Uh, a phone picture of the flow chart that's required <laughs> to add something like this into a campaign. Yeah. Because when you sit here and you pick apart the cards and you've played it a couple times, you're kind of like, all right, well, if that happens, then we go there. And then that was random. So I was say, okay, so act two, it goes to move three. And then the, then the train station and then town hall. And, and you just kind of go through and you see how all the different little moving pieces kind of interact. And it's like, oh, God, how many drawings must have been required to get to this point <laughs> so I, I i don't know i'm a process nerd so i'd love to see stuff like that i feel like it could work in like a dreamlands type thing where you're really trying to explore open-ended style um it's interesting that we got this scenario as part of forgotten age too because i feel like a lot of the campaign is very like not on rails but it's you have very clear emissions here compared to even something like Carcosa, where it's all like mystical and you don't know what's happening half the time. Like Forgotten Age is very much like, let's find the thing, let's escape the thing, you know? So <laughs> it was uh, a nice change of pace too, I think, to get Threads of Fate uh, in there that's very much not that. Mm-hmm. I was really surprised that we came back to Arkham. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like that, that I was like, oh, it was, it was kind of a cute jungle. little check-in, wasn't it? Like now that we know where yeah. we go straight afterward, it was like, oh, hi, ha, ha, checking in to seeing how things are going. Okay. Bye now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I like that. It's that part of that classic, like trope of, you know, you unleash the evil, you go back home. Uh Oh, the evil's back. We got to go deal with it now. So yeah. yeah, I, I must admit part of me though, I was like, this is so unrealistic because the 1920s, like the costs of going back to <laughs> the states, northern states, and then traveling back with an expedition. I'm like, no one would ever go back a second time or leave before they're done. I'm like, they're on that fat Miskatonic uh, payroll. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that grant money exactly. must be good. One way or another, don't you have to come out of the jungle with the artifact, though? I guess so. Either that, or you just cry off from the campaign and. Fade into the west like failed gunslingers? Or did the failed gunslingers go east? Uh, go west. Okay. They went west. Yeah. They went the same way as the elves. I think I remember noting that. <laughs> Maybe they went to the same place. Yes. We don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so as far as, as far as kind of how it starts off, I like that kind of set the tone for me too, which you have Ichitaka there. Um in your house essentially uh after the events of uh the the deluxe expansion and then she's basically cluing you in that things are about to go bad and you're stupid for uh, giving the relic up to other people 
And then you have the option of essentially uh, she's going to leave and says not to follow her. And then you have the choice at that point to say, no, stick around. You have to tell me your story or to let her go. So that I mean, I know we have other choices similarly in other scenarios. But for some reason, that helps set the tone to me of this kind of getting in depth with these characters and making choices of how you're going to deal with them. Because I don't. I don't feel like we got a lot of that with other NPCs in past campaigns, where this one is, I think, actively forcing you to decide how you're going to deal with these people. And it's it's pretty hard to choose Alejandro over Ichtaka. <laughs> it really Ichtaka, is. It, <laughs> Ichtaka is badass, and Alejandro is just kind of a douchey whiner. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. Though, to be fair, I feel like, I feel like I undervalued Alejandro's ability at first just because i didn't see how much ancient specifically ancient locations would play in Mm. outside of threads so far he's he's had some kind of play potentially in every scenario that you could control him in yeah so there's that at least um i also really like that storyline wise you kind of trying to actively engage with Ichitaka and like, and you know, trying to, I think the goal would be to, you know, convince her that you're okay and that she should open up and like, you want to help, even though you were the one who brought the artifact out, you want to fix it now. It costs you. Mm -hmm. Every time you, you try to cozen up to Ichitaka, you take a cultist token, which I think is kind of cool. And what's really cool is after this scenario, so far, the cultist tokens have all just been, like, surgy effects. It's all, it's all like, reveal another one, and if you fail, then X happens. So it's not actually, outside of this scenario, making your bag harder. <laughs> but it is adding extra implications to every test you make, which I think is just kind of a cool little... Yeah. I assume that was the intent. It's definitely playing with the paranoia a bit of, like, who to trust and which one to trust, both, neither, etc. Because you can kind of read it one of two ways. One, you're getting these cultist tokens because, like, she herself is some kind of cultist or or untrustworthy person. Um, she's definitely... She's a true believer. She's definitely hiding something, you know, that much. Uh, but the other way you can read it is that you're getting those because by associating yourself with her... You're obviously attracting the attention of all these cultists who she seems to be, like, locked in a a battle or, like, turf war with, so. You're also opting in to any prior shit she has going on. Yep, all that baggage. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, And it's interesting, too, because you... Uh, The only of my investigators who has taken this option is Ursula, uh, but you can also uh, forge your own path and not trust anyone, depending on some past choices you made, which is essentially taking the choices where you kind of shun both Ichitaka and Alejandro. And then in that case, you remove all cultists and tablets from the bag and just get an elder thing. Okay, so then kind of breaking down the scenario itself just on a basic mechanical level. So you've got your three uh, act decks, each of which corresponds to a different objective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do you guys go about deciding in what order and at what intensity you're going to address those three different objectives? So so I suppose Uh, let's outline the objectives are recovering the relic, recovering Alejandro, or figuring out what the hell Ichitaka is going off to do. <laughs> I usually leave Alejandro because I just don't care about it. <laughs> uh, uh, but I think one one thing I try to do, at least if I can in multiplayer, um, is don't ever actually finish an act deck until the very end. Mm. Because there's there's things that scale within the game where, you know, like, oh, this gets plus one whatever for each act deck that's completed. Um, so you kind of want to, like, just edge up on everything and then just in, like, one fell swoop try and finish all three. Or at least two, I found. Yeah, I feel like my initial... I definitely take that approach as well. Um, although if I'm in, like, striking distance of finishing one, I might just do it just in case, like... I'm thinking to myself, I might not get back to it in time or things might go Mm. badly. So it kind of depends. As far as which one I tackle first, some of it is just proximity. Like, oh, that location is the closest. (laughs) So I'll go there first. Yeah. Or depending on like, 
what the situation looks like in terms of how I complete it. You know, is that going to be a low shroud, high shroud location? Who am I playing with? So I, more than a lot of other scenarios, I haven't found like, oh, there's just one optimal thing. Uh, other than I feel like I end up going for the relic a lot first. I'm not sure why. Because the story implores you to think it's important. <laughs> more, probably. <laughs> probably. <laughs> yeah. It seems kind of important. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, I also haven't, <laughs> I, I'm sure if I charted it out and got a set, because I, I know some of the beats now uh, that I would know, like, okay, this is going to lead to combat, but I haven't taken the time to, like, really outline, like, oh, I'm on this path, so this is what I'm going to face. It still ends up being a surprise to me a lot of times. If I was more diligent mm-hmm. about that, then I could probably plan an ideal strategy, but I, I don't think I want to do that, so... <laughs> I think this one's also really interesting in that your encounter sets are different based on mm-hmm. on what you've done mm-hmm. thus far. Now, I think that more than anything adds the variability to the different playthroughs because, you know, in one playthrough I was like cultists for days, and then the other playthrough I was like cultists and snakes, and it <laughs> felt really different. Mm. Yeah, that adds to it the different things you get like i was looking through the cards in preparation for this uh episode and there were some of the things that i still haven't seen yet i was like wait that happens there's a train station like <laughs> i haven't even seen that ever and i've played it like five times i think so i'm i'm excited to go back and try to get all the different uh interactions that are possible while we're talking about encounter cards can we discuss how absolutely awesome and backbreaking uh even though it only came with three encounter cards uh or treasuries <laughs> um like nobody's home <laughs> you have to spend an additional action to investigate a location like that is brutal it, like orn library is a place right I didn't. Am I the only one that thinks that's horrible? <laughs> <laughs> I think it, it probably didn't stick out as much to me because you play more multiplayer than me. So in in mm. solo, this is more like uh, not as bad. You know, if there uh, most lo- mm. locations only have one clue, so it's like okay, that's one additional action. But yeah, if it's like four or five clues on a location, then that's just terrible bad at that point. Yeah, the secret must be kept. The uh peril <laughs> test will plow willpower take one damage one horror for each act deck the investigators have completed it gets plus one difficulty and deals <laughs> plus one damage plus one horror um so funny enough i believe this was the card that killed skids one game mm. um because we had i think two of the decks gone because willpower just, like... is important maybe <laughs> well i mean a five willpower test would be hard for anyone mm. and the fact that if you fail it you're taking three damage and three horror like who who can survive that it's it's a very intense treachery yeah yeah and and it has peril so unless you have the ability to deal with it it's just yeah it's it's backbreaking and i love it because (laughs) it scales with how well you're doing Mm mm-hmm Right? Like, if it's right at the beginning of the game, it's test three, which is not too bad. Take a damage or horror. Okay. But when you're near the end of the game, it can just be like, well, your game's over. Go home. So. Yeah, I think this is one I remember using uh, uh, Perseverance with Calvin against, if I remember correctly. Because it's <laughs> it was one of those ones where it's hitting for, like, three damage and three horror at that point or something like that. Yeah. That sounds about right. I, I actually want to throw a big up out to Conspiracy of Blood, which mm. to me is ancient evils, but interesting. Agreed. Mm. Yeah. Yep. Agreed with that. So it's the one that pops out and attaches to the agenda. The agenda gets minus one doom threshold, which is essentially what uh, ancient evils does. But this one lets you the gives you the ability to potentially parlay uh, cultist. At a decently high test, so this isn't this isn't easy, but if you succeed, you can get rid of you can get rid of the uh, the treachery. So I find that level of interaction, hard as it is, more interesting than just add a doom to the agenda. It may advance now, <laughs> and I do like that if you fail, 
you place a doom on the enemy. Mm-hmm. Like so, you're like doubling you'd be down. Like, yeah, I need to pass this, and I, I I do like it a bit. I I think you're right compared to ancient evils. This is a better ancient evils because it also doesn't advance the agenda right away. Mm-hmm. Like it puts pressure on you, but if you just went into the witching hour with the mythos phase, it doesn't automatically just flip you over. So. And I think it's just further evidence that uh, I think most builds for a blind play that I play from now until I have evidence to suggest us to do otherwise, I'm going to be playing fine clothes. They're just they're just going to be in that deck. Yeah, parlay has become a test <laughs> that shows up often. <laughs> and I like that. I really like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I think fine clothes might end up being a little OP at the end of the day because of that, yeah. but I'm I'm fine. It works. I like how the cultists are, are pursuing a dastardly plan, and they're like, but wait a minute, you're wearing a suit, never mind. <laughs> I'm going to get rid of yeah. this conspiracy of blood. I'm wearing my tux. <laughs> I uh okay. I will say the only thing I'll say is it's and it, I don't wouldn't put it down as a negative but one thing I encountered is uh because things can play out so differently you can get in a situation uh probably mainly in solo cuz you in solo is where you have an investigator that's just geared towards one thing like combat or evading uh like I mentioned mm-hmm. earlier that my Finn solo run was he's done well in every other scenario and he just tanked this one he didn't get any of the uh, objectives completed and it was because two of them were uh combat focused and they can play out differently those same uh paths can also be like uh clue focused or something else but because of past choices they both involved combat and i just didn't have the cards and the boosts i needed to pull it off and kept drawing poorly so i just ended up having to resign there's no way around it so, can I take a quick moment here, and I feel like this might apply a little bit more to Boundary than it does to Threads, but it still does apply to Threads if you have the right conditions. Um, and, and dear listeners, I'm going to go ahead and use a little bit of blue language here, so if you're listening to this at work or uh, among squeamish children, uh, <laughs> I'll give you a moment to pause. Earmuffs. All right, still with us? Okay. Fuck the fucking fuck out of Brotherhood Cultists, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. fair. <laughs> they, I actually think, like, in a vacuum, the as an enemy, it is brilliant design and I love it. But mm-hmm. when this card is coupled with, uh, what's what's the stupid, is it chanting? The the chanting one from the mysterious, mysterious chanting, chanting from the, the, the mm-hmm. standard cultist set. It can get just dumb. The fact that it gains plus fight and plus evade for its doom just makes it, mm-hmm. like, the the boundary... Well, we'll get to boundary in a second, obviously, but the boundary play that I just finished today in preparation for this, this podcast, Finn spent... Finn. Mr. Evady. Mr. Mm-hmm. Evadeserson. He spent three turns... Locked up with this stupid cultist. Couldn't fight him. He was at like six to evade. And I just couldn't do anything. Mm-hmm. And then when the agenda popped, I'm like, alright, thank god I can do something now. Next card I pulled, Mysterious Chanting. It's like, no! <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I, I had to get that out there. It's a really interesting uh, enemy design, especially in a in a campaign that supposedly is... is um is incentivizing evade over combat but the fact that it also gets plus evade means it just oh god it can get real bad sometimes they almost feel like a a mini boss which i'm okay with because there's only i think two of them in the encounter set uh yeah yeah two of them two of them but they they can be rough yeah that was the problem finn ran into with that that uh play as well it's like it had one of these out that was boosted to hell and then a wizard of the order as well and he was trying to put out those fires while also being hemmed in by these people he had to fight it was yeah but overall i'd say threads was actually 
um, a breather in difficulty compared to the Forgotten mm-hmm. Age box. Um, mm-hmm. Forgotten Age box, as we mentioned, as everyone has talked about, is kind of a step up in difficulty. And then Threads came along, and uh, granted, besides that one playthrough, and it is possible to get harder runs. Overall, I feel like this isn't as hard, and and it's also because it's one of those ones where you're setting your own pace and figuring out what you can do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, bucking that trend. <laughs> Moving on. Uh, let, wait, hang on. Let's not move on to Boundary yet. Let's talk about, uh, we've got Resolutions and Interlude to talk about from Fate. Threads, rather. Mm. So, obviously, depending on which acts you complete, you get various things for it. Uh, if you follow Ichitaka and you listen to her story, you can potentially get her as an asset. You can get Alejandro. You can get the uh, the relic back. Any, I mean, beyond that, is there is there a whole lot to the the resolution? I'll be honest, I forget most of it. <laughs> Not really. It's oh, the expedition yeah. journal. But I I feel like you get that no matter oh, what. Yes. Yeah, I think the most interesting part is the actual resupply point after. But as far as the resolutions, I think it's just kind of toggling those things. Do you have the relic or not? Did you rescue Alejandro or not? Are you in tight? Oh, with I also thought it was interesting. Uh, this is, I think, one of the first times that we were rewarded XP for acts completed, right? Mm. Like that's that's kind of a new one, mm-hmm. which I thought mm, was cool. Yeah. So you get one XP per act one card that you completed during the scenario. So a cool opportunity for XP there, even if you don't plan on finishing all the act decks through to through to completion. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We also get a resupply, so you can buy more provisions and other provisions yeah. other as yet unoffered <laughs> provisions yeah yeah we get the pickaxe like pickaxe pocket knife and gas mm-hmm. those are the yeah. two new ones and for the very first time we can spend five xp to remove one trauma whoa yeah <laughs> <laughs> Which, to me, was one of those indications that I probably vaguely hinted about because I didn't want to spoil about why I think this campaign is, like, intentionally difficult. Either that or, like, uh, while they were testing it, it was like, okay, we gotta throw them a bone because this is hard. So, one of those two, <laughs> but, yeah. I feel like this <clears throat> leads into a discussion for another time, but it's also possible that the just the tenor of the game has changed from the last two cycles. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I guess we won't hey, know I, that until next cycle, really. Mm-hmm. I got, I gotta say though, five XP is a big ask. Yeah, I, yeah. I agree. Have you guys used that like option that... yet? Never. No, no me either. <laughs> I like that it exists. I just my mm-hmm. XP is precious yeah. to me. <laughs> like at that. Okay, so what's interesting about that is okay. So let's take it one one end of the spectrum. I'm doing really well. I've gotten one or two trauma just because I don't think you get out of Forgotten Age without any trauma. Mm -mm. Mm -hmm. If I'm doing really well and I've only got one or two trauma, like, I'm not spending my XP on that, right? Right. Okay, that's easy. That's easy to comprehend. Other end of the spectrum, I've failed every scenario up to this point. (laughs) I've got, you know, three, four trauma, and I managed to get five XP out of this scenario... I don't think I'm spending it on on getting rid of trauma. I'm upgrading my deck so I stand a better chance of not getting more trauma in the future, right? Mm-hmm. I I just I hearken back to my Ursula face check campaign, mm-hmm. where at the end of two scenarios, the first two scenarios, I had three trauma and one egg. <laughs> yeah, like, I, that sounds about right. Th- that's just you know, like, yeah. I the poison getting rid of poison for three XP. I can maybe see that one mm-hmm. um, because of all the things that poisoned directly affects. Um, and I mean, five XP for a single point of physical or mental trauma. Well, if you have healing in your deck, don't bother, right? Because it, it just, but poisoned, you have to actively either use your supplies. This or is the only this. way to address it, more or less. Yeah. So, aside from medicine. Yeah. If if the trauma was also three XP, it'd be more tempting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I wonder if there was a different cost that could have been associated with it. I can't think of it offhand, but it yeah, 
I can see what you guys are saying that it's it's <laughs> if you're already under the gun, then you probably don't have the XP to spend on uh, removing the trauma. Yeah, I think one neat thing would have been too if you could remove cards from your deck that cost XP. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, so anything you've invested so far, (laughs) yeah, you get a refund, right? Can I put my XP on layaway? (laughs) (laughs) Use it to to secure this loan. This is in my deposit. The trauma. Okay. (laughs) Okay. So then moving to the boundary beyond, we're headed back to Mexico via car this time. I don't know what we took last time. Was plane plane travel was a thing in the 1920s, right? Uh, Or was it all ships, uh, ships and trains? It was probably it was probably a boat. They probably yeah, I think it was probably a boat. Well, maybe a plane. I don't know. Well, in Mountains of Madness, they use planes, but uh... no, but they travel there on ships. They use planes for like scouting. I feel like planes were around, but not for like mass passenger travel. Someone, I'm sure, in in Discord will fact check it for us. But anyway, so we are into Mexico, road tripping there. Um, We've got a couple of little things at the beginning set up, depending on whether you have Ichtaka versus Alejandro versus the the arcane thrumming, which, uh, (laughs) by the way, was the name of my high school Gregorian chant band. (laughs) There it is. (laughs) Um, so you've got a couple things there. The the arcane, or sorry, the uh, the arcane thrumming turns your relic into the upgraded relic that actually has text. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Ichtaka gives if you have Ichtaka, okay, that's right. You miss starting the scenario with fewer cards in your hand, right? And then if you have Alejandro, you get two additional resources. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. And then if you don't have gas, yes. you can't take a mulligan. Yeah. There it is. That has happened to me every time I've played this. And I wonder how much that has actually affected my run throughs. <laughs> yeah, I think I've usually had two gas that I've taken. So it hasn't been in. Oh, there, no, there was one campaign where I only took one. But I, I think the justification in the text was that you have to get out and walk. So you're so like haven't had time to prepare that you can't mulligan. <laughs> Oh, and by the way, I'm just seeing now that that my recollection of the varying encounter sets did not apply (laughs) to Threads of Fate. So if any of you were scratching your head out there or are in the middle of calling into our hotline, um, this is what I was actually remembering. Scratch that for Threads. This is the one where, depending on what you've got going on, different encounter sets hop into the the quest, the scenario thing. (laughs) Yes, yeah, that's correct. I also got confused. <laughs> so it wasn't, okay. it wasn't just you. You're, you're a good friend for not stopping me and calling me an idiot, but you probably should have. Uh, it was because I was also thinking of this one. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, the exploration deck is also nicer on this one, mm. kind of. Because you've got uh, <laughs> if you have s- eight, eight locations. If you have average Yeah, one. eight locations of Fortress Dream. I was say, I feel like in theory, yes. <laughs> In yeah. practice, though, I have drawn every one of those treacheries before the game's out, before I actually get anything like <laughs> Same on here. the board that I can interact with. <laughs> Same. Yeah, fair enough. But what were you saying, Scott? Uh, like the numbers of... Oh, it's uh, eight locations, four treacheries. So, I mean, you're a little more likely to get a location, but it's not like half and half. Yeah. It so. is... Wait, because how many... There's... Six locations, and there's two versions of each, right? So there's 12 total, and then four yep. treacheries. And then four uh, treacheries. Oh, sorry, yeah. No, it's, uh, yeah, three to one. But, yeah. But, I, but I am the, like way my... the, the way the <laughs> encounter deck or the exploration deck ends up working in practice is that you churn through so many locations before you either hit the one you're looking for or yes. a treachery. But you only have four treacheries to go through. Is what I'm saying. Yeah. Like a typical throw ball, though. I guess the I guess the difference is because this one you're looking for the matching location icon instead of the mm, matching just a connector. connector. Yeah. yeah, my first two plays yeah. of this, yeah, I had the same experience where I drew every treachery <laughs> before I got a connector. So yeah, that was a, a real table flip moment for me.
I'm not sure if Ian stopped talking or if we just lost him. Yeah, I'm not sure. Can you guys okay. hear me? No, oh, I can hear you. Yes. Now. Okay, beautiful. So, uh, basic basic premise of this scenario. Let's let's just hop right into it. Wait, um, wait, wait, wait. Oh, go. Player cards. Oh, thank you. Player cards. <laughs> Player cards. Let me get them pulled up now. Boundary Beyond. What did we have? Oh, we had some you interesting know, stuff in this pack. This one was okay. Mm-hmm. I don't think it was anything crazy. No. Um, it's it's I no like, uh, Threads of Fate, I'll tell you. Yeah. I like Cornered for Survivor mm-hmm. because it basically turns every card into a unexpected courage. Dude, Cornered is what I expected Scrapper to be when when we were starting mm-hmm. to get like those really class-specific permanent mm-hmm. uh, talents. That This is what I thought Survivor would have. So I'm glad to see it. It's you know a little unfortunate that we don't get the permanent on it, but it's still very survivory and awesome. Yeah, yeah. I think these new fangled skill boosters are kind of the best cards in this pack. Like high roller for rogue is super good. I've been using that a ton. With it's pretty much has gone into my rotation as one of the uh, early upgrades for any of my rogues. And then I've gotten mm-hmm. a ton of work out of well prepared and guardian as well. Yes. Well prepared, especially with Guardian, where just like you generally have a fair few things in play. Like you've generally got a weapon. You most of the time you've got a primary ally. Like I know you can say that about most investigators, but I feel like Guardians doubly so. Mm-hmm. And that just gives you tends to give you so many options for generally willpower and combat boosts, but occasionally something else fun. Yeah, it's good. It's yeah. good with the story allies too because they have a. Uh... Quite a few. I think they each have Ishtaka and Alejandro both have three icons, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, so damn, do they? I will have to double check to make sure I'm not just <laughs> pulling that out. But uh, that's my memory of. Um, and and I'll go ahead and just say it here, since Nick is not with us. Well prepared is a very good shotgun card. <laughs> that it is. Yep. Because yes. shotgun itself has two uh, two combat icons, which is exactly <laughs> what you want for a test that you're performing with shotgun. Yeah, Ichitaka has a combat agility and wild icon. Okay, and Alejandro has something equivalent, probably uh, will uh, intellect and some two other ones. I've got him in my fin deck. Hang on, <laughs> we'll solve this so, mystery. One of the cards I think that a lot of people. It started a lot of conversations about good or bad. Is recall the future mm. <laughs> as a good mystic <laughs> card should. As a good mystic card should. I I kind of think I am pro recall the future. Uh, once you get the elder or was it the elder thing tokens in the bag? Mm-hmm. Because I find like. Cultist tablet skulls, except for the Gen Con snare, apparently. <laughs> um, <laughs> like, they're on standard, let's say they're on minus two, minus three, and then the Elder Thing is, like, minus five, right? So if you just name the Elder Thing, you only have to go to plus three, and then you've rounded out the other icon tokens, if you want to call them that. Mm-hmm. Um, like you look at the icon tokens and figure out, okay, what's the highest one? Mm-hmm. I can basically ignore it as long as it's not more than two over the next highest one. Which, I mean, is just... It's it's a little bit of minute math, but it's just getting rid of one more token in the bag that's going to cost you fail. Right. It's essentially shaving off, and even in something Forgotten Age, which is notable because usually our, our highest cap is negative four in standard, and then it threw a negative five at us, and then it just changes mm-hmm. how you play. With this, you can name negative five, and all of a sudden you're back to, like, say, negative four is the highest, or negative three, something like that. Yeah. This card, I feel like... I feel like it's it's mediocre in just your general purpose deck that wants just a little bit of hedging against the, the chaos bag. If you're mm-hmm. running full chaos bag manipulation, this card is amazing. Because, okay, so say say you're running Olive, as you might do. <laughs> the thing about yep. Recall the Future is you can then just, like, dive into the math and be like, all right, what bad stuff, like, what token in general is going to hurt me the most? Or, like, what's even in the middle? 
And, and yeah, I think you covered it well, Scott. It's it's just mighty math, and not everyone's going to be willing to actually get the fullest out of this card. But if you sit there and you mm-hmm. kind of analyze the chaos bag, and you're pulling more than one token, whether that be with Olive or Dark Prophecy or Statue, mm-hmm. the fact that and this doesn't exhaust until you hit what you name, like you can just and sit that's here. the thing. Yes, <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. like that's what sells it. It's not like uh, level zero defiance. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Where you're like. Ooh, I'm going to throw this in, you know. This is just like, hey, choose the worst one. And if it doesn't come up, you're all good. Use it again, right? Mm-hmm. It, it's And, and BD Flory throws up in the chat too. Like, you put this in gym if you're going full-on control. Mm-hmm. And he's got rid of skulls. And then if you have two of these out, that covers two other symbols. Plus, you can seal something else. Like, you can just... You can just never make the chaos it. bag your prison. He flatlines it, yeah. right? Like... Yeah. So, I I I am positive on this card. Yep. I still stand mediocre in a general build, but if you're if you're leaning into manipulation and willing to do the required math to get the most out of it, this is an amazing card. Yeah. I I would say though, even in a generalist build, near the end of a campaign, when you have those elder thing tokens in there, this might be worth like even the last scenario throwing one in. Depending on the math on the tokens. So it'd be very campaign specific. Yeah. yeah. But but more or less, yes, I agree with you. Interestingly, the so, one I've probably played the least is the Seeker one, Quick Study. I've included it in my decks. And mm-hmm. uh, I think it's just the case of like you have higher ed already, which covers most of what you need <laughs> to do as a Seeker. That uh, I just haven't really... F- and you have stuff like... Uh, uh, not Pathfinder, but oh god, I'm good. field work. Um, that, that I just mm-hmm. haven't found uh, a lot of cases where I'm like, oh, I really need to put this quick study down. So it's a, and I feel like in general, seekers uh, have actually not gotten the most uh, bomb cards in the in the cycle this far, and I'm actually fine with that because they got their yeah, share before. Super okay. So yeah, because up to this point, it's been a seekers game, and everyone else gets to play it. Yeah. Okay, but I'll throw this out, Roland. Sure. Yeah. Conceded. Yep. Definitely in rolling. Okay. Yeah. It. I. I feel like this is the the seeker off class higher ed. Mm-hmm. Like when you can't take higher ed because you can't, you take quick study. And I, I think there might be something to just loading your deck up with all of the different seeker effects that gear off of having a clue on your location. Sure. Mm-hmm. Or also controlling a clue because then you can oscillate. And I feel like you know. If you need it there, then then this is just take any skill test, and this is a great way to put it there. Mm-hmm. Um, also, just the silliest art in the game thus far. <laughs> For sure. This guy is either 12 or 52. <laughs> There's no middle. Are you sure it's a guy? No, I'm not. I, I, not at all. I think it's Eddie Munster. <laughs> got, a, got, a, got his own office. <laughs> oh. You know the most latest season of Arrested Development? The cop that Michael keeps on talking to? Mm-hmm. It looks like her. <laughs> yeah, I can see that. Yeah, yeah, because her shoulder pads are a little sizable for, for mm-hmm. her build. And she slicks her hair back like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I see but yes, I agree that the, <laughs> he's either 12 or 52. <laughs> I guess it is a yeah. quick study, so this person is yeah. apparently living up to that title. Okay, the last one I want to mention before we move on to the scenario is try and try again, simply because the fact that it goes uses three tries. Like, <laughs> yeah. I read that and I'm like, A, awesome. B, fail because it's not try and try and try again. Yeah. Try, try, it should, try, try, try again <laughs> is what it should have been. You're right. Anyway, I yeah. I have never played level is is it level two or three the original level, level three. three I'm pretty sure yeah I don't think I've ever played level three but I think I'm more likely to play level one here because if you think about like over the course of a game the amount of times you'll get to proc that effect it's not likely to be that three or above right like. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I guess if you're playing in intense difficulties, maybe the the scenario changes. But 
It, uh, if I'm if I'm including level three, try and try again. If I'm hitting it three times in a scenario, I'm ecstatic about that. I think too, like because this is one XP, I'd rather spend two XP on the two copies of this than three XP on one copy. Yes, of exactly. level three. It also puts it within min range, which. Uh, yes. Not saying it's a slam dunk for her because I think she's pretty solid on her own, but at least you have the option. Mm-hmm. No, but I feel like as the Carcosa cycle was releasing, Min won the award for ooh almost for for cards that came out where it's like oh that would work really well and oh no it's it's three level mm-hmm. okay. oh. yeah okay so then moving yeah. to the scenario mm-hmm. since since we've already preambled it. Do we have? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's round back to that thought afterwards. Everyone, get out oh, your whips, boy. and now we'll commence thirty minutes of us whipping ourselves. Yeah. So, please the, take off your job. <laughs> the, the, the idea of this scenario is that you've got present day locations that don't have any clues, and you've got to explore for ancient locations that correspond to to that location, which bring the clues with. And then the whole idea is the, the actual mechanical goal is to try to maintain as many of the ancient locations as you can with no clues on them until you finish the scenario. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Which is a simple task, but it's not an easy task. Or is it? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so essentially the way it works is you're exploring but instead of like exploring through the jungle this time the deck is representing like trying to pass through the barrier into the past i was actually a little bit confused about the story mechanic uh connection of this one because when it was first spoiled i thought uh that it was gonna be like oh there's tears in time so locations are gonna randomly flux back and forth between past and yes. present that was my initial like impression we'd see something closer to lost in time and space right. right so then when i started playing it then it's like no you're actively trying to go back into the past which was a bit weird like i'm still not 100 percent clear on what's happening i think it's like it's taka is trying to take you on this journey to see different visions and so that's why you're intentionally trying to uh, like break through the boundary of time and see these things, but yeah, it, it was a bit confusing at first. Um. Okay. So so I've only honestly run through this one three times at this. Oh, I'm sorry, four times because technically Nick played a played a couple games with me standalone. This mm-hmm. this one's really interesting because I feel like your primary goal has to be maintaining those locations, right? And there are so many little effects that, well, there's one treachery in specific. I'm going to pull it out here because it's it's just an asshole. <laughs> uh, window to another time. That is ancient evils unless you shuffle uh, an ancient location back into the mm. exploration deck, right? So it's tempting you to backpedal on your progress to not take a doom. And guys, that's a mm. trap. Take the doom every time. Yeah, like I, I will tell you that my most successful runs on this is where you just take that doom because chances are the amount of actions and time and effort and resources it took you to get that location out and clear it mm. of clues is worth a doom. Yeah. That's the thing we didn't mention with the exploration mechanic earlier is it's not just exploring like other scenarios. You just you just mm-hmm. spend an action to explore each location is a different thing which taxes you a ton like one is discarding cards in your hand with cost four or five i think another one is mm-hmm. to take one damage and one horror another one is to spend three resources etc so each time you fail like when you're face planning four times in a row like i've often done like Yes. That's pretty much it for you. You know, you can kind of come back, but you're in a really tough spot. Like, you haven't even gotten one location yet, and you've already deprived yourself of, like, your hand or your resources or your health and sanity. So it makes it really rough. You kind of got to get lucky with those early explorers, I think. Yeah. Punch yourself in the left ball, (laughs) explorer. Punch yourself in the right ball, explorer. Dude, the, the... the Silas and Finn uh, run through that I just completed. This this campaign has actually been going exceptionally well up to this point. Mm-hmm. Zero paths unlocked in this <laughs> run through. 
And it's yeah. all due to those fucking cultists, man. Like, and, and, and this is another scenario where the cultists can pop out and then all of a sudden be inaccessible because the pathways change when, when you hit an, uh, an ancient location. Mm-hmm. So I had, I had a situation where I had uh, Wizard of the Order pop out. And I hopped him into a location that I thought I was going to be able to go to. And, you know, this was my misplay now knowing the metagame of it. But I then went, uh, explored and got an ancient location out. And all of a sudden now I have to go three locations before I can hit that Wizard of the Order. And it turns out that's kind of a problem. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. The, it's There's a ton of enemies that come out. Uh, and again, it depends on what sets you get. You can also get, uh, either you're getting these cultists... That are just gathering doom because usually you're trying to put them somewhere else in the map uh, so you don't have to deal with them, but then they're going to advance too fast. Or you get the Esli Guardians, which are just pinging you. And then there's arrows from the trees in the set too, where my freaking Lola oh. took six damage within like two or th- within like three turns. I think it was ridiculous or four turns. It was just so rough. Uh, I that was the scenario where I used double perseverance with Calvin to handle those arrows from the trees. Uh, it, it just hurts you a lot there, and it's a small map. And we've said it again and again, but small maps often make for harder scenarios especially for the Mm -hmm. type of play styles i like to use a lot it's yeah there's a lot working against you even the big enemies are you know like both of them are hunters essentially except for the serpent like if he's not at an ancient location then he hunts Mm -hmm. um or wait no is that the other way around either way he moves around if he's at an ancient location with no clues right yeah. Right. So, like, yeah. yeah. Either way, oh, with clues, like, with uh, clues, he gains retaliate and alert. He is not a hunter, so he he camps. Otherwise, down. it gains hunter. Yeah, uh, and then Padma Amarita, mm-hmm. whatever, is just a beast. Mm-hmm. Sure like, is. Oh my goodness! Yeah, she's devastating. Yeah, let's alert, retaliate, hunter. Mm-hmm either hits you for a doom or you take three horror. <laughs> like, and while she's ready, you can't discover clues from ancient locations. So, like, you have to deal with her or else you can't advance, mm-hmm. like, towards so, your yeah. goal. To, to its credit, though, this is one place where an evade-heavy strategy is actually a good one. Because if you can evade her, and she's only a three evade, and then discover the clues out from under her, you can kind of squeak through. Taking her on, uh, Silas and Finn killed her to, to move on, because that was just what I was equipped to do by the time she came out, but she's she's a tough nut to crack. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's rough. Finn solo actually had one of my best solo runs, because he could evade and was just able to evade and get out, but almost all of my other campaigns got a trauma in the scenario in some form. <laughs> but I, I feel like uh, that's why this scenario is especially tough solo, though, because in two-handed, I can at least have someone try to run interference with Padma uh, while the other person is, like, discovering clues and whatnot and what they need to do but and kind of play with that. But it's tough. And then you also have the Harbinger popping out at, at a point so <laughs> on this small map. Uh, yeah, I, I've gotten to a point where I almost feel like this scenario is a damage control one for me. Like, screw getting, trying to overachieve and get all these paths. Like, I get what I can, but I'm fine if I get zero paths if I get out with no trauma, honestly. Yeah. I'm in the same camp. It's uh, it's It's kind of like... It's really just to gird your loins, maintain as best you can. So... I've played through this three or four times now. Nick and I, when we played standalone the first time, and and we'll we'll round back to this because I I really want to talk about the Forgotten Age as a whole at the end of this. Uh, but the the face check into this one is just super rough. Oh man, yeah. Oh. Yeah. So so we we failed hard there. The second time we played through, we got three paths. We played I think Roland and Norman. Um, my 
Mateo and Ursula somehow. I, I still don't know exactly how this happened. I'm pretty sure I didn't miss any rules, but it's it's me, so I wouldn't guarantee it. They got out with five paths, and that's that's my personal best. Jeez. Wow. And and then like I said, like I'm alright, I got five paths. I got this fucker figured out, man. And then I fire it up with Finn and Silas, and it's like, nope, zero. It's like, oh, okay, that now we're back. Now we're back to where I thought we were. <laughs> Yeah, it's it would be funny to try an approach where you just like barricade yourself in a location <laughs> and just try to get to the end and so you can survive. But yeah, yeah, Man, I, I I I don't know what to say about this one play tip wise except what I said earlier. Like if you have cleared, if you have traveled to and cleared a location of clues, you never ever give that up. Take the doom, take whatever else you can. Never give that up because that's the whole point. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's I was mentioning the elder thing in this scenario earlier uh, because that one is especially frustrating if you get it. I had it with Ursula because it's something you get for the forging your own path, and it's a minus four. And then if you fail, you have to put a clue on the from the token bank on an ancient location. Oh, I, I think I drew that like three or four times. So every time you think you're making progress, it just yeah, you got to forget about it. It's it's rough. It's rough. I think I think one of the brutal things too is like we talked about how exploring is uh, difficult because it's not just action explore; it's action you know kick yourself in the face then explore. It's it's pay um, your cost before you know what you're getting. Yeah, yeah, and then sometimes what you're getting it's is treachery. like <laughs> when this location is revealed, uh, lose all your actions. Hi, Sean. <laughs> Sorry, I blinked out for a second there. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So I was just saying, um, it's not just pay your cost at the beginning. It's also when you actually succeed, you might also get one of the locations where it says, oh, hey, when you enter this or when this location is revealed, uh, you lose yes. all your actions. It hits you right? as like, you're walking in the door, and it hits you yeah. when you've walked through the door. There's one you, where you yeah. draw your weakness, I think, that hit me on a face check. That was a nasty surprise. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's some rough ones in there. It, I think, like, yeah, the each investigator at this location discards two random cards from their hand. <laughs> like, yeah, and the other one, like, go find a snake enemy, take direct damage, take direct horror... Oh. <laughs> I think my so, yeah. my so, best run was actually with Mateo and Silas, where I got four paths, and a lot of that was because Mateo had the tools to just like auto pass some of those key, very key tests. But <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. it's I, so I, I feel so. Like- t- Takeaway from this uh, this whole roundup uh, is bring Mateo because Mateo <laughs> is my best run too. Yeah, it- quietly powerful but really good at boundary. I get, yeah, yeah. I guess it's a, a thing that's amenable to control type approaches. I don't know. It's the only tip I could really give, and it's not really a tip because I haven't found like a silver bullet. Is just being very intentional about your path in advance. Like what ancient look, which explore costs can you suffer? Mm-hmm. I, I often end up doing the damage and horror one though because that one hurts, but it's. It's something that I can spend right off the bat, whereas like giving up cards in your hand and ass and resources and all that can be really rough. Or if you're playing with a low will investigator, the uh, the location that as you test will is probably not a good one to go to. So, yeah. Okay, so I think we've sufficiently aired our grievances. Resolutions on this one. It's, I mean, so depending on how many locations you've cleared, you get the, those paths have been, is it opened? Paths opened? Uh, known to you. The paths so. known to you, I think it is. Yeah, yeah. paths known. Uh, the Harbinger is still in play. You could hopefully stack up a little bit more damage on him. That's pretty much the only actual progress my <laughs> Silas and Finn campaign <laughs> did, is they, they put four more damage on the friggin' Harbinger. <laughs> Hooray! <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> pissing in the ocean eh? <laughs> yeah 
Well, and then chances are you've had to deal with the one serpent that's in the deck no matter what, right? And then Mm -hmm. on top of that, if you've also had to deal with Padma, like you're Mm -hmm. guaranteed three more vengeance out of this scenario unless you're really slippery. Yeah. The one thing I'll say is the resolutions kind of throw you a bone that if you get no resolution, uh, you take the trauma, of course, but there's no really added penalty lumped onto you other than the fact that, you know, you didn't get to find more paths or whatnot. But yeah, it's... that and you probably also failed the willpower test on the back of Agenda <laughs> sure. 1B and yeah. have a new weakness. Yep. <laughs> probably. Probably. More than likely. Yeah. I think that Sean willpower isn't important. <laughs> <laughs> it's really not. Surprise, surprise! Finn accumulated a new card. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's just a test you take on the chin, <laughs> on the chin, and 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 deep in in the scrotum, <laughs> straight um, into the palantir, <laughs> <laughs> right into the seeing stones. <laughs> The stones are no longer seen. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so then the interlude, we are going back to the jungle. So we have... Do you know where you are? Six other things? Yeah, a ton. <laughs> so, so, I mean, this is this is really similar to the, the interlude in the middle of the Forgotten Age box. It's just like it runs mm-hmm. through, do you have X? Okay, either good thing happens to you or bad thing doesn't happen mm-hmm. to you. Move on. Yeah. Yeah, it's just uh, yeah. one of the things I am really happy with the Forgotten Age campaign is how the supplies have uh, played out. Because I was worried initially when it was uh, spoiled that maybe there would be some kind of ideal setup of supplies. And I think there are some that are more oh, optimal than others. But it's just a matter of kind of choosing your poison, <laughs> um, sometimes mm-hmm. literally, but it's, there's going to be pluses and minuses to whatever kind of, uh, choices you make. So I like how that's played out. Uh, like here, if you have I'm the actually... canteen, you get a clue next scenario. Um, if you don't have provisions, you start with three fewer resources because you're starving. So it's just a lot you have to balance. Mm-hmm. I'm actually really looking forward to once, once everything is released and we see how all the dots connect, I'm really looking forward to 2019's Arkham Knights where we metagame the shit out of picking our, <laughs> our supplies for Iron Man because <laughs> I can Iron Man age. Forgotten Age is going to be insane. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> remember, remember, the only medal we give is for finishing. <laughs> Finish, finishing is winning. Have your, yes, two, have your two backup is. investigators ready. <laughs> Yeah, only two. Okay, three. <laughs> <laughs> just, just bring the whole set. Yeah, just bring your whole collection. Yeah. No big deal. <laughs> uh, All right. Well, I, I I'll say one last thing because I we talked about the gameplay, but I will say I do love uh, the story and the locations and the location art. Being someone who's been really interested in Aztec history and being a historian and all that, like it was. That hardly ever gets represented in games, at least the ones that I play. So it was cool actually seeing that um, in various forms in a scenario. Even if that was the, the the little thing that gave me a smile as I was getting my face smashed in. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's a really cool setting, right? Mm-hmm. And it seems like Matt has really put in the legwork to do the research yep. here. Um, I'm no expert, but everything seems in its right place. Mm-hmm. So, and the art is all fantastic. Like oh, the location so art mm-hmm. in this scenario, or, or sorry, not in just this scenario, but in this, this campaign is just stepping it up even from Carcosa. Mm-hmm. Agreed. So, I think I just need to vent here for a minute. Lay it on me. Oh, I fucking hate this. Story. <laughs> um, Tell me how you really feel, Scott. So, I, after finishing this scenario, and I think you guys remember in mod chat, I came in and I was like, I don't want to play TFA anymore. Like, I'm done <laughs> with the Forgotten Age. I was so pissed. Over it. Now Just play- over it. Yeah. Na- now playing the next scenario, I'm like, okay, I see, like, with the way it works. and like, okay. 
But this scenario, and maybe I just need to play it a few more times now that I understand how it works. And well, I feel maybe, like your opinion won't be very different, though. <laughs> maybe play it on standard, but like, I this. Oh, wait, you were playing scenario, this on hard? Yeah, <laughs> Good God, yeah, man. I was. It left such a bad taste in my mouth, and this is the first time I've had this with Arkham, mm. and I was actually like. I wasn't mad. I was disappointed, you know, <laughs> which is just uh, so much worse. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I, I don't want, like, if Matt hears this, I'm sorry. Like, I, I don't want to sound mean, but I did not enjoy this scenario and I will give it another couple shots, but uh, I don't know. I just felt like this one, this, it was too punishing, right? The whole explorer where it hurts you before, it hurts you mm. after, and even hurting you before with the cost, you might not get a benefit out of it. And they were really big costs. Uh, you have three boss level enemies that are running around on a small map. Um, and everything leading up, like with the trauma and everything, like I was, I finished this scenario and I was not happy. I'm a little bit better now because of the scenarios I've played since. Um, <laughs> But What's I just have to vent what, what, and give a voice to those people who also felt the same way because I see people in chat and they're like, <laughs> "Okay, yeah." So, so let's so. this this is a this is a full discussion for the next episode, which we're gonna mm-hmm. have. But I want to I want to sneak peek and and ask one very specific question that I'd like each of you to answer. How do you feel? about how harsh the Forgotten Age campaign has been thus far to a face check. Ian. To a face check specifically? Um... Yes. How do you feel about how hard it is to those, you know, we are of a group where we are fully bought into this game. Any scenario that comes out, we're probably going to play a bare minimum if we hate it, like five times, right? Oh, yeah likely twice or triple that sure i see what you're getting at yeah but but those people out there who exist who play this more casually might only play this one or two times how do you feel about this kind of scenario being so punishing if you don't know exactly what you're doing yeah i get what you're saying because at first it's like for me face checks aren't that huge a deal because i expect to kind of lose and i'll get used to it so i feel but i feel like just in general it's hard to say but i have to say overall it definitely feels like a spike in difficulty i could definitely see uh players who like they're just jumping into the game oh let's play forgotten age you know go back and play the other campaigns and i could see them having some feel bad moments like there's actually been surprisingly very few times in playing arkham that i've gotten legit frustrated uh like a lot of of course, I've had my losses. I've had my auto fails that screw you at the worst moment, like everyone else, and you're cussing up and down the house. But Boundary Beyond's one of the few moments in Arkham that I can actually remember being legit, just like this, like angry, frustrated, like I'm, gonna, I'm just not having fun. I'm gonna go I'm do something be else. Doing something yeah, else. I'm gonna go play this again in like two days or whatever, and pick it back up again. Um, so that to me is a little bit of an indication that I agree with Scott. Um, that I think there was maybe one or two too many layers of difficulty within. Like, maybe just have the Ancient Enters Play hits or the costs on Explore, but not both. Or, you know, those kind of things. Or maybe don't have the Explore costs at all or make them more manageable. Just different ways. As far as the cycle as a whole... um as far as face checks go, yeah, I think it's a bit too difficult for face checks. I think when you get to know the Forgotten Age scenarios in the box, you kind of get a bit of a handle on them. But this is a rough, rough face check. It kind of reminds me, and it's funny because this is the third cycle of the game, but it reminds me of when Heirs of Numenor came out for Lord of the Rings and was just smashing people. And it was such a huge step up in difficulty <laughs> compared to the cycle before. And this fe- It's exactly feels like that. Mm-hmm. Because because we had we had Shadows of Mirkwood in Lord of the Rings, and it was like, okay, this is kind of as expected mm-hmm. based on the experience we had in the core set, and that's Dunwich for Arkham. And then we hopped into Moria, where it's like, whoa, this is, this is kind of harder, guys. Whoa, all right. So, and then we kind of got used to that. And, you know, aside from the odd you know really punishing card no one was really like oh this is too hard it's just like oh this is harder that's carcosa Mm -hmm. 
And then you jump into uh, Heirs of Numenor and Against the Shadow Cycle. There was so much, like, I, I legitimately came close to quitting playing Lord of the Rings, the card game, which is a game I have probably over the course of however long I've played it now sunk several thousand dollars into. I was so close to quitting playing that game at, at Heirs of Numenor because of freaking Peril and Peller gear. Because it, mm. it, it just was such a spike. Do you think it's that spiky, Ian? And and Scott, you played Lord of the Rings, of course. Well, Heirs of Numenor was the box that we you and I played on Octagon one night and we went through and beat all three scenarios. Well, for with shot. with decks that came out like three years later. <laughs> so caveat. Yeah. You can go back to yeah. it now and smash them with you know yeah. decks, but when it came out it was rough. It was brutes. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I Scott, think... so answer answer the original question first. How do you feel about the difficulty currently to your your face check type campaign? And how do you feel about that? Is it okay? I mean, okay, do you so, like the fact that it requires a little bit of metagaming? I mean, so here's my thing. Like like you said, for me, because I am the person who's going to play it multiple times mm-hmm. and metagame it's And I mean, even we've been preparing for... Iron Man and I mapped out Carcosa over a day, right? Like, what decisions are we doing? Who are we killing? Who are we, you know, stuff like that, right? Mm-hmm. I enjoy that. Um, and so, therefore, like when you mentioned the whole supplies issue, um, I look forward to being, being like, okay, four players, we have 16 points as a team. We need to buy this, this, and this at these points in time mm-hmm. and stuff like that. That's really cool. Face checking. Um, I think. The supplies are overly punishing because, um, like Network says in the chat, no, binocul- no binoculars? Fuck you, mental trauma. <laughs> right? Like, like <laughs> you have this huge list of stuff and you can't take all of it. Um, and I think if you read any of the previews of the articles, medicine is probably something you should bring because there's all this talk about poison, right? So that makes sense. But should I bring binoculars or a canteen? Well, to me as a human being, I'm like, well, I need water more than I need to see far away. But you can't use that logic in there. And trying to use that logic, it just you sometimes get punished. So the face check aspect of it, I think I, I'm i not a huge fan of how punishing the supplies are. The difficulty level, I think... <sighs> You can't separate from the supplies, but if you could, if the supplies were not as punishing as they were with all the trauma, I think the difficulty level would be okay. The issue is by the time I got to, um, God, what's this scenario called? B- Boundary Beyond, like my characters were already so beat up <laughs> because I didn't have binoculars and I didn't have these other things that it was just salt in a wound. And it made me feel really negative about it. Yeah. Yeah, and I think the first couple times you come across that, it's more like when you're playing the first scenario, it's it's the supplies feel kind of cool, even if you don't have them, where it's like, oh, if I had the canteen, I could have done this, and but I have the map, so I can do this, and that's cool. But then when you hit that interlude, and it's like, did you bring a blanket? <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, Charlie. Yeah. Try better next time. And there's, there's really no agency or recourse outside of simply metagaming it. Which, you know, as you mentioned, has its own value, and I, too, look forward to, to kind of charting out what we're going to do for Iron Man in 2019. Mm-hmm. I, I think, to the casual player, it feels rough. It is. A little bumpy yeah. here and there. I think the thing is, like this was Scott was touching on, that the fact that there's both supply punishment and harder scenarios, like, You could have the supplies dealing out trauma like it does and say you have kind of Carcosa level scenarios that that would be fine because it's like in the past two campaigns before I felt like trauma didn't really pop up that much until you're poking into harder difficulties and that kind of thing. Uh, But so I I'm I'm fine with this campaign, like exploring trauma and interacting with supplies, like this idea that you're investigator steadily wearing it down but then you couple that with a scenario like boundary beyond that is just like independently of supplies rough then that becomes a combination that's that's a little a a little tough to overcome even for experienced players 
Now, I think I also have to put in here this opinion that I'm sharing, I think, is at the end of Boundary Beyond. Mm. Uh, now that I've played... Hard, hard of the I can't remember. Thank you. I can't remember mm. the scenario names of this this campaign for whatever reason. Um, Heart of the Elders, I'm a little bit more... Okay, <laughs> I, I, I see what you're yeah, getting at. And I like, know what you mean. That was really cool, and it made this one sting less. Mm-hmm. Mm. Um, Agreed. But, but that didn't help. For the month I was waiting for the Heart of the Elders, you know what I mean? Like, I finished Boundary Beyond, and I was like, well, I finished Arkham. (laughs) (laughs) I'm good now. Yeah. Well, that's a wrap. (laughs) Gonna conquest this one. So, yeah. Okay. (sighs) Well, there's definitely more to be said on this general topic, but we'll leave it it there for this episode. Yeah. Uh, Final thoughts on Boundary Beyond, outside of its heart. (laughs) Okay, so hang on, real, real quick. Would we say that this is the hardest campaign scenario thus far? I think yes. I might. <laughs> I'm gonna say yeah, probably. I think I think yeah. a close second might be Dim Carcosa. Mm-hmm. Cur- depending on what you did, curtain calls up <laughs> there. Cur- cur- curtain call, depending. Yeah, yeah. I suppose curtain call just based on how ill ill equipped you tend to be at level zero. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I think this one takes the cake. I think Easily so the too. hardest. So I wonder if... And, and here's what's really interesting about this. is like, okay, that's fine. But I wonder if that was the intent. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm glad uh, to hear that you maybe. guys also wonder that. <laughs> well, I feel like looking... <laughs> I don't want I don't want to spoil anything from Heart of the Elders, but I'll just say looking at Heart of the Elders made me look back at Boundary Beyond and and like Scott said, kind of say, okay, I get that the intention is that you're not really supposed to get close to getting most of the paths. If you do, it's mm-hmm. it's a nice thing. But it mm-hmm. seems like the par is probably getting about two or three paths is is kind of what you're aiming for. So that did make me think of Boundary Beyond differently. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mm-hmm. change my experience of like, oh, I'm psyched to play Boundary Beyond. I feel like it's always going to be the scenario in the campaign that I'm like, yep. okay, let's get this on the board, see if I can get out of it without trauma. I agree. It's at, kinda... at Iron Man, this is going to be our next Essex County Express. <laughs> We're going to need to drink heavily yeah. for this. <laughs> <laughs> it, I, I think it reminds me of Midnight Masks, um, especially when you see not a lot of let's say new players on our discord or the sure. Facebook group or Reddit or whatever, where they say, I only got four cultists. Do I need to replay it? And we're like, no, 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 no. Just keep, just keep going. Maybe this is that scenario. Mm-hmm. We just haven't realized it yet because we're still new players to it right. where it's like, Oh, I only got like three paths. And it's like, Oh, no, 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 just keep going. It's mm-hmm. fine. You're good. Right. Like it, it so I, I'm willing to wait until the end of the forgotten age what? to reassess Agreed. It as a whole. What are, what are you doing bringing your sound logic and mature speculation into our, our brief <laughs> session here? Sorry. Rabble, rabble. <laughs> there, how's that? I will be interested. We need to round back. Since this was such a point that all of us individually talked about in mod chat when we hit it. And like obviously we've spent so much time on the podcast talking about it. When this campaign wraps, we have to round back and, and revisit how we feel about Boundary Beyond. Mm-hmm. Yep. And we will do so. Yep. All right, guys. Uh, so before we move into tentacle time, we have <laughs> we we have a, a five star review that we've yet to get to, which I'm really fond, uh, or sorry, really fond of and excited for because it's you two, and I get to just sit back and listen. So um, I feel like Scott has a distinct in- <laughs> advantage in this impression, but <laughs> <laughs> like do. You- Ian, do you know who these guys are? I do, but I've only seen Strange Brew the movie. I haven't seen the actual like same. old school okay, skits. Same. Mm-hmm. Do you know how to do the little the little bird? No, call? I have no idea. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave that to you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, save right. it for the cast. This is the cast. Oh, okay, damn it. <laughs> um, how are we going to split this I though? Know. Do we just both each I take just a trade back and forth? Just, I guess so. Yeah, for so for the line. audience, we have an impression as Bob and Doug McKenzie of Strange Brew fame. 
All right, so how about we just we switch every punctuation mark? <laughs> okay. So like every every period or question sure. mark or whatever. And whoever is not talking does the karukuku karukuku. Okay. Do you want to start? Sure. Or? Hello, eh? I want to give a nice little... I think that's more Australian. <laughs> I want to give a nice little shout out to the good fellows of Mythos Busters. For, karukuku, karukuku. for a consistently interesting show. Also... <laughs> They will talk about the good strategy and decks for this time. And we'll have a few brewskis and some laughs, eh? I always look forward to hearing the crazy yards they to spin and their tales of what they think about new cards. And they don't even say sorry. <laughs> this here is a top-notch podcast. All other podcasts can take off to the Great White North, eh? Kurukuku, kurukuku. <laughs> yes! <laughs> Uh, Take off, eh? <laughs> hosers. What a hoser. <laughs> Bunch of hockey losers. Uh, th- thank you, Tim, for, for that wonderful review. And uh, I-, I would just remind everyone out there, if you want to hear us do silly things like you just heard, feel free to leave a five-star review out on... Is it just iTunes? That feels unfair to me. Because I'm an Android user, and I don't like to be alienated, but I think that's the only thing that populates through our RSS. So, unfortunate as it is, that's where we're at. So, guys, what's been grabbing you lately, Scott? Uh, Ian, do you want to just combine yeah, our yeah, topic? I, think, <laughs> I assume it's okay. the same. <laughs> uh, so, LOTR digital version came out. Um, I've put about five, three to five hours into it. I'm not really sure on the timeline. Um, I'm actually really enjoying it. It's it's very different from normal Lord of the Rings Um uh, but I really like it. I think it's 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 like paved its own path. You know, like it's going to be different. There's going to be things that are similar. People looking for a direct port of the card game, you'll be very disappointed. Um, but if you go in looking at it like I want something that feels like the card game, but is different and digital. Yeah, I I'm really enjoying it. I am actually floored by how much I enjoy it. <laughs> um, Maybe I shouldn't be because it's Lord of the Rings related (laughs) and I'm a sucker for that. But I feel like there are a lot of times, you know, I follow the streams uh, here and there. Not I don't, you know, catch everyone. But I feel like there were times during development when they were showing it off where I was like, I don't know if whether I'm going to like this, like it's not hooking me. And even playing the demo on Gen Con, I was like, I enjoyed it, but I wasn't super enthralled with it. But ever since it's dropped in early access, like pretty much all my gaming time, uh on tuesday mm-hmm. that is uh pretty much all my gaming time since then has been devoted to it i've really gotten hooked on it whether or not that lasts i'm not sure it kind of depends on where they go from here uh but so far mm-hmm. i uh, you know as an avid tabletop player um of the actual you know lord of the rings lcg that they, it's changed a bit but my biggest worry was that they were gonna take the meat out of it and then it was just gonna have no decisions and it's just gonna be like throw your guys out there and fight <laughs> uh but i feel like there's actually a lot of decision points in in any given game um yeah. which has made it kind of hook me i think i went in super blind um like i had not watched a single stream i'd kind of kept up with the chat on the cotr discord about it like one guy's like, oh, they showed this on the stream. And I was like, oh, that's, cool. that's neat. Um, and I was just like, basically, like, when it gets here, it gets mm-hmm. here. And I'll play it then. Um, and I saw a few screenshots. I was like, oh, it kind of looks like Hearthstone. But I mean, it's... Oh, so you're saying it's... a digital card game looks like the digital card game? How <laughs> wonderful an observation you've made. I know. Whenever people compare it to, like, Hearthstone, I'm like, just because the little dudes are circular <laughs> and you drag them to the other thing, it's like... Oh, you understand look... how geometry works, right? There's only so many frames and shapes. <laughs> it's like, it doesn't look like Elder Scrolls Legends because those cards are are rectangular. It's like, dude, they picked a circle, an oval. Like, who cares? <laughs> like, it, it, it doesn't mean it's going to be like Hearthstone. It doesn't play anything like Hearthstone besides how you literally drag <laughs> the shapes right. to the other shapes. Like, that is the only... Oh, you mean like basic mouse GUI? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How dare they? Use 
How yeah. dare they plagiarize? Yeah. Click and drag. Yeah. <laughs> Bill Gates from 1992 will be sending his cease and desist. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's. Uh, I definitely yeah. suggest people check it out. It's unfortunate that it's kind of gotten hit with a lot of bad reviews because of the pricing model. Uh, which is before, you know, you had to pay for each quest and only the first quest was unlocked. Um, I think the advantage in their favor is that they have been really quick to respond to everything. Like they quickly changed yes. it. So now that they're going to unlock the whole first campaign for free and they're going to refund mm-hmm. people's valor points if they already paid for it. And they had like this time lock where after the first time you win a quest with certain heroes, then the next time you play, you only get like, 25 valor versus 200 so they got rid of that so uh, the 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 tough thing is you know these people (laughs) we we all know the internet by now they're very reactionary like there's no waiting time they go from initial disappointment to posting like a five paragraph negative review within like five seconds and so and they're doing mm-hmm. it like this is this is like a triple a game that yeah. that has been hyped and whatnot like this is freaking early access people like when those reviews started popping up i'm like okay so 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 let's My talk favorite, to- sorry sorry really quick yes. my favorite review was the guy who got really angry because there was no pvp and i'm just like <laughs> Do you know anything about this game? <laughs> like, yeah. just, wow. Okay. It, your your opinion is moot. All right. Like, I, I'm not a big fan of early access as a concept, but I'm also not a fan of freemium. And here we are. It's 2018. You're knee deep in it. So we just have to live with it. But mm-hmm. I mean, like, I just I just don't understand how people can just go flying off the handle like they're they're rating what is supposed to be a polished and finished game. It's like, no, this is early access. This is beta testing that you pay for if you're really excited about the game. That's what. That's where we're at. Like, just, ah, uh, I hate the internet so goddamn much. Yeah, because it's like, of course, you know, there's stuff that can be adjusted about their pricing models, yada, yada, yada. But, like, to have, if you, they've gotten, you know, a fair share of negative reviews, and I'd say fully 90 to 95% of them say zero about the actual gameplay. It's just all about the pricing mm-hmm. model. And, like, it's a shame, because if you actually play the game, it's really good. And there's stuff that could be tweaked here and there, but the fact that it started at that level uh, just makes me think, like, of course they're going to improve it, and it's going to get better over time. But, unfortunately, the internet doesn't give things a chance sometimes. And I'm not involved in a whole lot of, like, testing beta alpha. This is my first early access I've ever bought into. But I have never seen or been made aware of a developer that has been as quickly Mm -hmm. and and conscientiously responsive as Fantasy Flight Interactive has been to the initial. Mm -hmm. Like, the early access was out for a day. Mm -hmm. A fucking day <laughs> 24 short goddamn hours and people were already posting these stupid ass reviews which you know fine if you hate the game you are entitled to your opinion and if you have feedback great that's what they're looking for but i just i don't comprehend how people can just be so reactionary and vitriolic to something that they're supposed to be excited about helping make better and i <sighs> I'm not sure how much they understand the fact, like, of course, we don't want, like, super exploitive models in video games. No one wants that. No. But at the same time, like, like people kind of got to get paid, too, <laughs> for making this game. And if yeah. this, this thing doesn't make money, then it's going to die. Like, that's, you know, it's kind of a thing that they can't just give everything away for free as well. One thing I'll say about it, too, and I, I know, Sean, you touched on, like, the freemium model or whatever. I think there's a there's a vast difference between the usually iPhone or sorry phone based app games mm-hmm. where you can pay for crystals right. to speed up your whatever like mm-hmm. Clash of Clans, and then there's games like uh, this and Hearthstone where like you can spend money to get stuff quicker, but ultimately everything in the game is accessible by grinding. Right, like there is no cards that are. I mean, besides cosmetic stuff, uh, but there's no cards in this game that say you can't have this unless you give us real money, right? And now it is early access, so they are asking for money to get into early access. But once it is out, I mean, you could spend zero dollars on this game and play it as fully as I do 
someone who chooses to throw a bit of money their way because I don't want to grind a bunch. And that's and I think, fine. Like, as long yeah. as that cost is reasonable. And I, mm-hmm. I think BD Flory had a, had kind of the summation here. Like, every quest and hero that's currently there under the, the model that they came out with costs you $16. Yep. Guys, there there are video games on the PlayStation Network where if I could pay $16 for that game, I would be thrilled. Mm-hmm. Like, I just... Oh, God, I hate the fucking internet. <laughs> and, and, that's and, that's and, all I can get out of this conversation. And $16 is to buy everything. Yes! Right? So what if you just spend $8 and play the fucking game? Like, ugh! Sorry. I'm really... Uh, like, I, I understand they're making tweaks to their... their mm-hmm. uh, the pay amount. And you know what? I kind of do agree with some of the frustrations because the people who got the uh, Lord of the Rings Deluxe two-player thingy-majig... Um, and you got your mithril access, which is like the the, the top tier. Mm. This is like if you want to buy everything at its highest, most premium cost, that's what you get. Yeah, like and it, it the mithril one isn't even offered in the game. Like you have to have ordered the the box set. It doesn't unlock everything, <laughs> which I was like, okay, I I can see an issue with that 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 is an issue but i think with this refund that's coming back with the quests you will now be able to unlock everything well and and let me be clear from my standpoint frustrations and feedback are completely valid but there's a mature fucking way to do it and it's not flaming everything that is about the game and giving it a zero or one star or whatever those damn reviews on steam were Mm -hmm. it's it's not that it's hey Here's what I like. Here are the issues I have. Here's where I'm not giving you a five stars. Mm-hmm. Like they're 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 reading those reviews and they're paying attention. There's a way to communicate that isn't just screaming. <laughs> My fit, Casey just said here, <laughs> and those people could have earned about 275 valor in the time it takes to write a pissy review. <laughs> <laughs> That's those things. Some of these reviews are like, like I said, like four or five paragraphs. Like, <laughs> yeah, I just I just don't understand. That's what it comes. Anyway, down to. okay. So, so, so my toss in here is that I have not played a whole lot, and and my technical time, I'll just throw it in here. Shit has just dropped all at the same time since Gen Con. Everything, <laughs> everything I'm playing has come out with an expansion uh, since Gen Con. So I'm I I feel like I'm behind on Arkham. At least I've played a couple campaigns through to the most current scenario. Lord of the Rings came out with a new box and a new uh, a new adventure pack that I've yet to play. The two-player set that we just talked about, that came out, and I've played one scenario of that. Um, what am I missing? I mean, that's enough. I also have gotten a Switch, which I've barely been able to touch. And, oh yeah, and then, then I restarted a, a play of Dragon Inquisition that, that has been keeping a fair <laughs> amount of my time where I can't be sitting at a table. But uh, as far as the digital card game goes, I've played through the tutorial in one game of the the starter game. After seeing the reaction and then the the pivot from from FFI after that first day, I'm like, you know what? I'll, I'm gonna let the dust settle a little bit before I dive into this really hard. So I, I'm gonna kind of let it just sit for a while and see if any big changes happen. But what I will say is that. They apologized, or they don't really apologize, but they they acknowledge like three separate places that hey, this tutorial's bare bones. We're gonna improve it. I was really fucking impressed with the tutorial. Yeah. Anyone else? Like there, there are a couple UI things that could be a little bit more clear. Mm-hmm. But and some of, and some of the play decisions, I was like, mm, yes, I wouldn't do that. Yes, I do think the tutorial actively walks you into making like bad plays. But you know what? Yeah. In, in a tutorial where they're just trying to teach you mechanical things, I can forgive that. But the fact that it was, like, it's a narrative, there are story mm-hmm. beats, and, like, random, like, heroes will pop in, and, and like, you know, it's somewhat spoiler alert, Bilbo is your tutorial hero. I love Bilbo, so the fact that, like, the first thing I get to play is, like, hey, it's Bilbo being a bur- burglar. <laughs> like, it was a cool way to I, do it, yeah. I didn't understand why they added so many caveats to that in early access because I didn't expect a fully polished tutorial, first of all. And what they had, I was blown away by because there was actually a fair amount of production value put into it. And in the actual quest, like the voiceovers, the ways the yeah. way the maps change, like it's, uh, you know, there's so there's some bugs and stuff. But personally, I was expecting that given early access. But as far as where it's at, it's 
It exceeded my uh, expectations. It's ahead of where I thought it would be at the beginning of early access, for sure. So, keep an eye out, because this this is potentially a harbinger for things in the future. It's Obviously, we, we don't know anything more than anyone else does, but if Lord of the Rings does really well, I'm sure Fantasy Flight would be looking at its other IPs to go, hey, what else can we adapt to this format? So... Digital Arkham confirmed. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's exactly what I meant by that. <laughs> but either way, I think even even if that's not a feasible you know uh, option in the future, if you're into Arkham and you really want kind of a quick, uh, uh, it's co-op eventually. Right now, it's just mm-hmm, mm-hmm. solo. I would give it a go. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think the the lowest en- barrier to entry is what seven bucks. Yes. You can spend $7 mm-hmm. and get the game. Yeah, so. you can figure out whether you Man. like it. You can uh, buy the other po- packs later if you want. Yep. And and if and when this eventually makes it to mobile, I know that's the goal. Uh, obviously, the game mm-hmm. is going to have to do well enough on Steam to, to be able to justify those development costs to bring it to mobile. But if and when it does, oh, I am so screwed. Because this is like everything that I <laughs> I played the shit out of in Hearthstone. <laughs> when, And what's funny about that is in Hearthstone, that was just a little offshoot of the main game. But it's it's yeah. entirely what I played. So if this comes out on phones, like, <sighs> I, I, I'm in trouble. I'm already worried because I was already, like, struggling splitting time between Lord of the Rings and Arkham. And now there's this digital thing that is sucking my time. And I have no idea how I'm going to keep up with it. <laughs> three different games going on i don't have enough lives for mm-hmm. these lifestyle games <laughs> is the problem <laughs> yeah that's the hey, thing Sean, yeah by the way hearthstone just came out with more single player content like a week ago la 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 la, la i can't hear you <laughs> <laughs> more content dropping <laughs> and just as a quick Dude, plug, I, just as a... I, don't, I don't have time for a game that i have been looking forward to since may yeah I, i'm in trouble <laughs> Just as a quick plug, uh, I did one stream already of Digital Lord of the Rings on yes! my Tales from the Cards Twitch. You can just search. Uh, oh, God, I can't even remember my own channel. I think it's Tales FT Cards uh, is the Twitch channel. And uh, I did one, and I'll probably do more in the future. If you want to see how and it plays. You and up you upload those to YouTube as well. So if yep. someone wants to come in behind, what's your YouTube channel? Yep, it's just just search for Tales from the Cards and the channel's Tales from, Tales from the Cards. So I have, of course, the old uh, tabletop playthroughs using Octagon, but you can find a digital stream there now. And once co-op comes out, I'm sure I'll be elbowing elbowing my way back onto Ian's YouTube mm, channel. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> I fully expect that. I'll leave some room <laughs> for you. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm just going to come charge. <laughs> just, just, none of this kind like, oh, hey, move over. Like, get the fuck out of the way. Scott's Ian. not <laughs> waiting for dinner. He ate his way through my fridge already. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Uh, all right <laughs> scott is the captain well <laughs> says bd4 god <laughs> <laughs> look at me <laughs> okay guys well i think that's gonna wrap it up for tentacle time unless anyone had anything pressing to uh to throw in before we wrap it up as always uh, M- eminem dropped a new album today and didn't advertise it at all and i thought that was really cool <laughs> at the end yeah, in this day and age, that's yeah. that's that's the thing. That's a, that's a like conscious I woke choice. Up and I woke up and read it. Was like, oh hey, yeah, the new album titled Kamikaze. Yes. <laughs> and did you then lose yourself in the music? Uh, it's pretty good. If you like his older stuff, like when he was <laughs> angry and did drugs, you'll like this stuff. Hmm. Yeah. Guess who's back? <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Well, let's put a bow on this one. Since it's been a while, I'll, I'll go ahead and run through our stuff for for the six of you who are still listening to this two and a half hour episode. If you'd like to hear some weird impressions, go ahead and leave us a five star iTunes review. Let us know who you want to read what impression uh, of your review. If you have any uh, comments, oh no, wait, Scott, what's your thing? Uh, questions, comments, concerns, gripes, bitches, or moans. Call the Mythos Busters hotline at 203-493-MYTH. That's 
203-493-6984. We haven't heard from anyone in a while since our, our little call-in contest, so I would love to hear from some from some listeners who have some comments, questions, bitches, moans, or gripes to make. The Miskatonic AV Club, as it sits, is in a bit of a stasis. We, we have to get caught up to... We're still back at Carcosa, guys. <laughs> <laughs> but we... We have aspirations to get caught up, so hopefully look out for those on YouTube and or Twitch. Um, always follow us at Mythos Busters on Facebook, Twitter, any of those social media places where you happen to be. And if you haven't done so yet, and I don't know why you haven't, I mean, just get on this. Come join our Discord, and that's discord.me slash mythosbusters. You can join our live podcast uh, recordings. You can just chat about Arkham the Card Game. And you could also, if you feel like it, chat in one of the six billion other channels we have in our server that don't have anything to do with Arkham Horror, the card game. All right, guys. Well, I think that's going to wrap it up for episode 43 of Mythos Busters. We will see you next time. (laughs) 